to another episode of our Daily Gun Show. Normally, we come to you live at midnight Eastern every weeknight, but my arm is killing me, and I keep passing out trying to wait that long. So, uh, yeah, it is early today, and we're uh, going live. So everybody's got links over on gun channels who normally would join in, and I'm going to quit reading the YouTube side. We're posting it on YouTube because it's easier. But uh, we've got uh, Woods joining us from... Pacific Northwest, in other words, uh, Washington. Thanks for jumping in. Yeah, thanks for the link. You bet. So uh, I guess we got some topics or we can talk about whatever. Um, let's see, what was that topic? Staging firearms. What do you think about staging firearms? Uh, anything, initial thoughts? Well, I think definitely it's a better picture if you're going to like think about it. Um, I don't think I'm, as a, a photographer, I'm particularly good at it, but there's a lot of people on gun channels that have put a lot of thought into, you know, putting it in the right place, and lighting and all that. And you guys were teaching me a little bit about how you, with a couple finger wiggles, you can change the lighting and all that. And I'm really looking forward to figuring out how to do that. I don't know. That's interesting because I think staging firearms, I think placing them around the house so you don't have to carry them or have them on you. Oh, I think I thought you were thinking pictures. Yeah, well, we can go either way with it. That's what it's all about. So um, let's see. What is today anyway? Today's Wednesday, so it's entertainment day. Totally appropriate to talk about staging pictures. Um, so I don't know, just a couple of thoughts there. It doesn't cost nothing. It's actually kind of fun to keep your eye out for little pieces, especially if you're doing knives and guns and EDC type of shit. Uh, having a few rugs or place mats are easy to grab little sections of camouflage or something easy to get a hold of cheap and you keep all that stuff in a drawer just kind of all wadded together on a shelf someplace and then you know have a couple of different colors and textures to play around with and uh it's all about the background really you, it's the sucker bet to try to take a picture of a gun or something just where it's sitting reflections and um, I guess it's mostly reflections, but colors will screw with the camera. So, uh, and mm -hmm. with the finished product, right? So putting it on like, uh, usually something like even like a blue towel or a, a green towel, not green, but like army green, olive drab, uh, something like that, where, you know, it's a color that isn't in the gun and it absorbs because of the texture and everything. It absorbs the, the light. Then that can really make them snap. Matt was just doing gun porn segment of the show and is it steadily that's always putting them on that rhinoceros hide that like black top or asphalt or something that looks like rhino skin yeah i think no, so. that, <laughs> that kind of plastic texture looks pretty good that's why i misunderstood you said about staging because i was just watching the chat you were on there yeah so um um otherwise what'd you think about whatever dude stuck a bullet through his trigger guard yeah, not a big fan of putting anything near the trigger that's not your finger when you're going to shoot someone. But Well, you're taking a picture, and that yeah. was to pop it up so that you could see it as opposed to just laying on the ground or whatever. I think the bullet works pretty good. It covers up the trigger guard, so depending on what you're trying to show off or how fancy the gun is or what model it is or something, like uh, the best, I think, is maybe an acrylic rod. People yeah. use those sometimes. Yeah. Um, We've seen gun shops that have them, you know, in, to keep their guns up in the display. But you're right. There's other things like uh, little, I guess, little triangle pyramid looking shape things sometimes for holding up like a figurine or like a plate or something. You know, sometimes those things can be used to uh, hold up a gun, especially if you're talking the side with like a mag release or a slide stop or some kind of crazy external safety. You know, those provide ridges and ledges 
right around the midline. So a lot of times right where it's balanced and you can uh, kind of hide the thing that holds your gun at a good angle. Um, you can also uh, flip things upside down. I don't know if people talk about it very often, but a lot of the better stuff, like even the Millennium Falcon when they film that, or is it the Star Trek thing, whatever, probably both. Uh, a lot of times they film things upside down and for whatever reason, you know, it's, it's easier for us, I guess, to deal with, you know, being right side up, but with the object upside down, you can get a whole different effect with light where it seems as though you were had a bird's eye view of the thing and uh, the light was just, you know, super uh, brilliant coming down from above. And you, you can't always do that, but you can do that sometimes flipping things upside down, uh, putting guns on their sights, for example, and then taking a picture. Uh, a lot of times, who cares looking right over the top of the site anyway, so you can white all that out in the photo editing or something. Yeah, the photo editing is one I look forward to learning more about. What are what are some of the uh, softwares that are free that um, that I could use for that? Unless for you don't computer. want to go, unless you want to go that way. I don't care, computer or a phone. Uh, well, to be honest with you, either one. The best one is on a phone because it doesn't cost nothing. You can just learn how to wiggle your thumb, and it's called Snapseed, and it's all one word, and it looks like a little green seed or something. And I don't know where they came up with that name. But it allows you to take an image and import it. Let's see if there's any way I can. Uh, I can't. I can. I can screen share on my phone. Let's see, but I can't do it interactively. I don't think. But I want to see if I can because I don't know. Let's see if you can. What channel am I on? I'm on. So I can change. Are you kidding me? I got some ranges now. Uh oh. So if I sign in with this one, there's a thing called um, YouTube Gaming. And with it, you can go live and screen capture off your phone. And it's for stupid kids to be able to show each other their video games, I guess. So if I go to stream and then next, and um, anyway, so I guess I'll, uh, I don't know, maybe there's a, I can't really, I don't feel like losing the channel. Um, uh, there's a thing called Snapseed. It will uh, basically let you open a file from pretty much anywhere on your on your phone, which is nice because previous apps didn't always let you go to everywhere on your phone. Sometimes it only go to your card or wouldn't go to your card or whatever. But anyway, once you open a file, you can choose uh, some, what do they call those things? Filters, I guess. Um, and I guess that's a whole nother realm that I just don't get into, but filters are basically presets, like on an old equalizer or something, you know, it's just like having a bunch of presets. So right. you might have a filter that, well, we'll get into that. So the filters are presets. So then you get into the tools themselves and you can crop it, right? Familiar with that? Chop it into a square, turn it into a rectangle, get rid of your old girlfriend, you know, get rid of something like a sign or a, I don't know, uh, so like for me with gun shops, I like to crop out the security cameras so that I'm not taking pictures of their layout with security cameras, right? So if I can crop all that out of there and still show what I want to show, how cool their gun display is or, you know, how big their shop is or whatever, you know, then that's effective for me. Um, you can rotate it, which you can do on your phone anyway, but, you know, at the last minute you want to turn it 90 degrees or whatever, the software lets you do that, again, just by flicking your thumb. You can do perspective, which is imagine if you took the four corners of an image and you could pull and drag each corner separately. So if you wanted to create a forced perspective on a, on a flat drawing, you could take the top left and the, and the bottom left and bring them together uh, towards the midline and you'd get a, a forced perspective. You turn it into a, what is that, a 
trapezoid room. Parallelogram? No. You turn it into a, uh, what if that's a trapezoid or what the hell call it? What that's called? Yeah, that's right. So um, let's see. You can do a lot more than just that, but then the biggest uh, power, most powerful thing. So those are basically basic image manipulations, right? But when you're talking about I have a picture that's too dark. I have a picture that the color isn't perfect in. I have a color. I have a picture that the shadows are goopy. They're just wrong, right? You can go to what they call Tune, which is about the most powerful tool there is. And have you used it? You used Instagram, right? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so if you open up Instagram and then you choose Gallery, uh, go to your phone somewhere and you find a picture. You pull that into Instagram, the first thing it's going to do is let you apply filters to it, which again are just presets. Or you can flip over to edit. And when you have you done that before where you flip to edit? Um, no, I have no on. So do you have a phone or are you on your phone right now? Uh, no, I have a phone. All right, everybody who's listening, get on a phone. And if you're not, then just go watch Matt's chat. So open up your phone and go to Instagram. And we can explain everything I was about to explain in Snapseed and Instagram, and then you'll see why Instagram or why Snapseed is so good. Um, I'm not watching the YouTube side, so I see a bunch of people are over there. Go over to Gun Channels or go over to Matt's chat. Um, I'm just sick of YouTube chats. So uh, um, let me know when you're in Instagram. Um, I'll be on, I'll be honest with you. I don't have the the app on my phone. Why are you crying out loud? So what the hell? Do you don't have a tablet or something in the house that has Instagram on it? Um, I, I had it for a while and then I I didn't go to it for a long time, so I apologize. But um, yeah. I could I could download it real quick. Sorry to sorry to have you go that far. Yeah, that's fine. So we won't even worry about it. One day we'll do that though. We'll just all. Um, uh, How do you use gun channels chat? You're fucking talking on gun channels chat. You already wrote a little colon D, so you figured it out. All right, now I'm just closing the YouTube side. Um, one day we'll do that. We'll go. To, we'll just go through and use Instagram all together. So basically, this tool called Snapseed, all the Instagram editing tools plus a few more. Uh, which gives you the ability to take a real shitty, muddy, muddy picture. Uh, your phone is taken, at least my phone, takes a 16 megapixel picture. So even if it's all muddy and shitty, there's tons of data in there. And, and Instagram or Snapseed uh, will go in there and digitally manipulate the tone and the balance, or I don't know what the technical words are, but you know what I mean? It'll, it'll fiddle with the, the contrasts and the highlights and stuff with a slider. So you just... Pick the tool that you want. You get familiar with a couple of three of the tools that do most of the work, and you just wiggle that slider back and forth. You don't have to know nothing. It's like when you used to go up. You know what I'm talking about with an equalizer, right? On an old stereo. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. so you equalizer. You didn't have to be some mathematical genius. You would just start wiggling on them knobs, assuming somebody wasn't going to break your arm for doing it, and then uh, you'd figure out what you like the sound of, right? Oh, this sounds shitty. Oh, it sounds a little better. Well, now if I fiddle with that one, eh, you know, there's infinitely amount of fiddling with it, but you figure out pretty quick which one is your, see, you figured it out right there. You wrote oops. So uh, you figured out, um, you know, that one's the bass or these three are the bass and these three are the treble. And if I move them together, it's the same thing except with an image. So, oh, I can remove, I usually open up an image. It's almost always not perfect. So in, in Instagram, you can just go in and tell it to remove the shadows, which immediately makes it less muddy and murky. And it usually makes your subject matter pop. Uh, and then you go in and you adjust what they call highlights, which is some other adjustment really similar. But again, it usually can just kind of make your subject pop. It, it's sort of the um, taking the background and giving it some depth, right? Uh, so those are the two sliders I use most often. Then depending on that final result after those two actions, I'll sometimes go in and fiddle with the brightness and give it a little bit more light because once you finish your picture, it's going to make it into a thumbnail, of course, and everybody's going to see it really tiny. So darkness is amplified when you start, when you make it small. So the brighter you can make it without washing it all out, the better you're going to be for just the, 
the thumbnail at the end of it. Uh, and then maybe depending on if it's screwed up because of the sun or because of something or another, uh, you can sometimes mess with saturation, which, you know, if your yellows are super bright yellow and they're not supposed to be, you can kind of back that down a little bit and turns your reds from brilliant cherry red down to a, just a tone of red. So you can kind of fiddle again with your fingers. So it's called Snapseed and that's what I'd recommend if you're, if you're looking for a thing to do and it's free. I think it's free. I don't think I paid for it. If it was, it was like five bucks. I've never paid more than $5 for now. Yeah, it's like a free Adobe Photoshop, exactly. But so much easier. Photoshop can do a lot of more things, but um, and this thing can too, but does it's there's no barrier to entry. You just start fiddling with it. Just like adding an equalizer to your stereo. You pretty much have to just figure out how to unplug your line out, plug your line out into the line in of the amplifier, and then take the line out of the amplifier and shove it to wherever your line outs used to go, right? So it's once, it's once you got that basic concept, plug your, your picture in over here, then you're just wiggling all the little equalizer bars. And, you know, at, at some point you get used to what those little equalizer bars do. Yeah, hmm. okay. I don't know. We're not getting any other people jumping in. So people have links. Uh, yeah. Well, what happens? I guess that's what happens when you go early. Um, any, let's go the other way. Staging guns, like, you know, place them around the house. Um, I do do I do that. Um, I have one by my by both of my doors. Um, that's in one of those where you hit the buttons a couple times, and that's assuming I don't have the one that I carry with me when I'm in my house, because I carry in my house whenever I'm anywhere. So, but I could see where, like, because but I don't have any little kids in my house. I mean, the youngest kid I got in my house was 23, so. I'm, I don't have like little kids that come by so I can see other people would be really reticent of that if there's like children around or something like that. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm yeah, about the same. I'm not the biggest fan of those furnitures, but uh, I guess they may be appropriate for depending on what your situation is, right? With the right. kids. Well, I, think well, I, I got those you don't have kids. You hit the buttons a couple times. And, you know, you have to hit it in the right order, and then you can get into it. Oh, you're talking about the um, what was the name of that? Kind of one? That's pretty much the best kinds to get. If I'm thinking about the same ones you're thinking about, they're like four little nubs that come up, and you right. kind of have to hit right. them in the, I have them on the wall, and they're hidden behind stuff because you know the ones that you buy that are like you know they're pictures or something. I I think everybody knows about them, and they're the ones I've seen in people's houses are obviously like there's a gun in there to me. If you don't, if you can even recognize the brand or anything, just because it's like obnoxiously big, or it's like the wrong, like whole thing, like for the room, like oh, this is a room that's like all this, and here's that thing that's you know, stark different. Right, right. But I mean, I've seen, I've, I've had friends of mine that did, you know, really good jobs. I got a friend of mine that in his house, right inside as you come, you don't realize it, but he's cut out a panel that he's got a little magnet and the magnet to open it is just sitting on the counter there, but it's just another, it's just a magnet. You wouldn't know, you wouldn't know by looking at the cabinet that, that, that there's a door that opens. I remember the opposite of that. I used to do a thing where I went to people's houses and I went to this old people's houses and I'm tall. So I could totally see the shotgun on the top of their cabinets. Like, you know, they had spent money to have their cabinets shortened down to their size so that they weren't, you know, they lived in their own home. They didn't want to have to reach up like kids on their cabinet or whatever. They're fairly short. So um, it was super plain to say that there was a shotgun up there. So when I left, I told the guy, I'm like, hey, man, there's a fucking shotgun up there. Everybody knows it. Now, does everybody fairly oh, tall people like you? Huh? Aren't you fairly tall? No, I'm saying these people had moved their, they had like custom made their cabinetry so that it wasn't standard. It was a lot shorter than normal. So for them, it was sitting up on top of the cabinet, but for everybody else, it was pretty obvious it was a shotgun sitting there. You know how the top of cabinets have like... That little reset, recess kind of area? Well, they're lower. Sorry, I don't know if I'm catching a cold or what, but um, you know how yeah. they're like 
one level, but then when they get to the edge of the cabinet where you put two together, you know, they'll come up higher anyway. So if, unless depending on what you put on top of it, it's not all one level. So the way they had it sitting on there, you know, they didn't realize that the, when it, the barrel hit the, the portion between the two cabinets, you know, it was at an angle and went up. So it was like fairly obvious that the shotgun barrel sticking up on the top of the cabinet. You could totally see the barrel. Okay. I, I thought it was okay. But, you know, for him, he just stuck it up there and, you know, for him, he's like reaching around. He probably just grabs the stock or whatever and pulls it down. I don't think it was all that smart though, anyway, because that's kind of a dumb place to, uh, hard re place to get to it. You know, if you fell down or if somebody's running around, you're not like, oh, let me just grab on top of the highest thing in my kitchen. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're going to stage, you better be able to get get to it pretty quick or, you know, otherwise... And I, I kind of feel like if you like in that situation, there's a possibility that somebody breaks in. Now you've given them a gun to work with. It might not be the greatest idea. Um, what about just, you know, in a drawer or whatever? Well, I try to, you know, I mean, I keep... I keep mine in a drawer when I'm sleeping, like when I'm right there, but I don't leave one in the drawer like when I'm wandering around because, you know, bad guys break into houses all the time. Where the first place they're going to look is your bedside drawers. Well, I see what you're saying. Not so much for a kid finding it, but for the bad guy being able to find it really. Easy. Right. Because maybe somebody breaks in my house through that, you know, bedroom window in the middle of the day when I'm at school and my wife's at work and there's just the dog and the cat here, you know. got to try to keep that stuff secure because that's where you know the stolen guns get out there and do bad things and i guess the uh cat's gonna be like hey he keeps a gun over there I'm yeah my dog that. would try to bite him my cat would be like eh go ahead do you stage any in your house oh i'm not going to talk about that on the internet But I think it's an interesting topic. Um, well, do you know anybody that does that or any of your friends do that? I don't think so. I don't know. Honestly, it's not something I've ever talked about with anybody. I figured it's their business. Now, when I was a little kid, I knew where they were. Like, I forget what age I was, but at some point, you know, I was told, like, here's where this shotgun is, here's where this is, here's when you use it. No, I definitely agree with that. I know growing up as a kid, I, I knew where my dad's shotguns were. I mean, I'm going to say maybe seven, eight. I knew I wasn't supposed to be touching them, but I mean, we had, we had shot, you know, his big old 22 and stuff. And he's, you know, we were taught respect that this isn't a toy, but I definitely know what room they were and they weren't locked. They were just like, you know, it was the eighties or that would be still the seventies. So they were just in a closet and, you know, my dad was from, you know, an old farmer, so he didn't even think anything of it. But that was back in the day when people, you'd go to people's houses and they'd have those glass cases in the middle of their house. Oh, yeah. Every once in a while, that'd be like in the basement or something. Yeah. But I mean, like, you know, there's, that was back in when you, you know, go over to your friend's houses, you know, with your parents or something. And, you know, I'd always be like, wow, those are really cool guns in there, you know, and there would be some sort of lock, but it wasn't like, you know, you know, my aunts and uncles and stuff. I've seen, um, uh, well, I was to say back in the day, I saw less of those cabinets like you're talking about and more just in the back of one of the closets, all the guns would be setting up behind all the clothes. And, you know, everybody I knew had something in a closet, either a shotgun and a rifle or a lot of shotguns. But uh, every once in a while, somebody would have like eight of them back there. We'd go back there and move the clothes and look at them. We knew. We knew enough if we were a fiddle of them, we got in trouble. But then we said we couldn't look at them. Oh, yeah, I did, definitely did that. We'd go look at them, but we knew very well if we moved any of them, we were going to get our asses whooped. So, Ghost, we're talking staging guns. First, we talked about uh, staging them for like pictures, and now we're talking around the house. Like... When you say staging, like hiding them or putting them somewhere for self-defense or home defense or what? Or for whatever, yeah. I mean, you know me, I don't really care about home defense, but right, just want to right. cut somewhere. I mean, if I want to answer the door with a gun, 
I don't necessarily want to walk all the way to the other side of the mansion. Have a gun sitting near the door, right? Exactly. Yeah, I've got them throughout the house. Yeah. I like wait for a butler to bring one to you. Yeah, I've I've, I've got a little bell that I ring, and when it, when it does, then you know my butler brings me you know the AK pistol or something, you know. <laughs> no, uh, no. I, I think for some people, um, yeah. I mean, you know, there's there's people that have the the thought process of I don't want to be you know any more than ten or fifteen feet anywhere in the house from a gun. And if if you have that mentality, then yeah, obviously you're going to stage guns. But um, I think that as long as you know um, you're comfortable where you are and you know, how you do that is your own you know personal decision. Yeah, like I was saying, I buy the I bought the little uh, boxes. They're like you know, they're fairly well hidden, but it you know they're you've got to hit about three buttons to get into it. That's assuming I don't have my you know pistol that I usually carry when I'm walking around my house anyway. Um, but you know, just you know that don't want the wrong people to get into there. Not that they couldn't find them or rip them off the wall, but at least it's something more. Well, it depends on who's you get. Man, I can't think of the name of that lock when I. Try, I'm not trying to think of it. I'll think of it. But um, Simplex, thanks. So um, uh, Fort Knox and a couple other brands, but mainly Fort Knox. I know they make theirs in the United States, and theirs is like 16-gauge metal or something crazy. So, uh, I mean, I wouldn't want to have put a gun in there and then have to bust into it because it would bend crowbars, it looks like. And that thing, because it's such thick steel, not only is it hard to, like, crowbar it open, and they made it in such a way that you're really not going to crowbar it open. You're going to crowbar the sides in a little bit, but that's not going to open it. And if you bolt that thing in because it's so thick, you're not just pulling that out, especially if it's in like joists or in uh, uh, studs or whatever. Like that ain't coming yeah. out, even with crowbars and stuff. At yeah, I put my on. Um, But the little thing like I bought, uh, I forgot to bring one with me, right? So when I went to Illinois... I had to put it in a box box, right? So I had to stop. I stopped at Iowa. I used it as an opportunity to check out, you know, some Iowa gun shops. And I bought a Liberty one. I don't like Liberty, the company, but I bought a Liberty one because that's all I had. And I had gone to my third gun shop already. So I was done looking at gun shops, right? So um, uh, it's super strong compared to just the little $25 ones I get from China. Now, Liberty is in Salt Lake City, but I'm pretty sure they don't make their little boxes here. It just doesn't look like something, you know, it looks like something from uh, overseas, not something from Salt Lake City, but it is substantially more stronger, uh, substantially stronger, thicker steel than the little clamshells I get. But those things need a key and everything. The the one from uh, Fort Knox, it's got little pistons in it. So it's got that simplex lock like you're talking where you got four buttons and you have to physically push like whatever to it's not like a code so much like one, two, three, but you just push a series of those buttons, right? Or I think it is like you push one, then a second, then the third, but you kind of tell it. And when that pops open, then the pistons push the top up. So it's not like it's delivering the gunner to you or anything. But anyway, I guess what I was saying is if you bolted that to the floor, to the wall, it ain't coming off. You're, that, that gun is going to stay there. Yeah, there's also a lot of companies out there now, like tactical walls that are creating like the furniture stuff that where you get, you know, hidden in plain sight stuff. And, but even just like a gun box, you know, that you have on a nightstand, uh, they've got so many things now, where, you know, the, yeah, it's chips and infrared readers and all that to, uh, fingers, you know, fingerprint scanners. And there's all sorts of stuff, the technology available is if someone wants to go and spend a lot of money on, you know, gun storage. They can, um, but, you know, I think that there's a lot of stuff that you can do on the cheap and, and oh, just yeah. be creative yourself, you know. Well, there's a book back in the day. Do you guys remember, are you old enough to remember Palladium Press? Uh, I remember, but I don't remember. I mean, I, I know the name, but I, I think they did, did a lot of publications that uh, educational stuff, didn't they? Yeah, well, that's yeah I mean, for, for tinfoil hat dudes or whatever. But um, yeah, this yeah. is like pre Y2K even. This was back in the day. So it would have been what they called survivalists. And uh, right. um, 
anyway, they had like the the ads in the back of uh, SWAT magazine or American Survival Guide or Soldier Fortune, and they might have like a column size ad or depending on maybe even a two page ad depending on what was going on. And then you would order their catalog. I don't know if you guys ever ordered their catalog, but they had a ton of cool books. Just so many cool books. They'd have rewritten manuals. It was basically all the stuff like at a really good gun show where there's like you know, a really good book person there. They'd have all those kind of books. And that person at the gun show had their books. But anyway, there was a book there called, um, well, actually it was a series of at least three I can think of called like 101 Ways to Hide Things or 101 Places to Hide Things or something like that. And it's literally just a little book and it was like $7 or whatever those little books cost. And it was super cool. It was just, you, you just kind of thumb through it and it's like, oh, doors are hollow. Oh, like vents, nobody looks at those. So like you're saying, um, something as simple as like a, a you know a air return or a vent on a little hacksaw or whatever, a little coping saw or whatever, you cut like a hole in some drywall, you know, just have a little understanding of how your house works. And there's all kinds of dead spots in your houses. And, you know, I don't know, was a bad guy going to realize that that weird looking air vent behind the door, you know, isn't mm -hmm. necessary mm -hmm. and there isn't a reason to put a vent there. Like, I don't think too many of them are actually like, you know, thinking about engineering of home air, air exhausts. So, uh, you know, you take one of those things, you find at Home Depot, you put a piece of, you know, black cardboard behind it so you can't see through the thing and a couple of magnets and you just kind of pull on it and it's a tactical walls mirror, except now it looks like a vent. Yeah. It doesn't look like you have a giant mirror right behind your door. Although the mirrors and stuff, obviously those have their places in a room or a right. hallway. I tell you another, another good way to hide a magazine and it's something as simple as finding a, an electrical outlet that you may not be using. You, you know, you, everyone's got an outlet somewhere in their house that, they've never had anything plugged into it. It's like in a weird spot. You can't get, you know, you, you don't want to use it or anything. Unwire it. Take the, take the plate off the face off of it. Unwire the back of it. Stick a magazine in there and no one's ever going to look at an electrical outlet, you know? Yeah. Or like I would say, just add another one, you know, it lights. Oh yeah. Something. Even better. Yeah. And just put a plate on there. Yeah. And I would be surprised if there isn't somebody already making some sort of a little unit that you can just buy and it has some sort of like hinge and a magnet or, you know, some kind of a little pop open thing. But yeah, that's the kind of stuff where bad guys don't know if your light switches are, like, oh, you, there's not supposed to be three light switches here. What the hell? And then one of them opens up to, you know, something else. So like the, one of those three bangers, you know, where there's three light switches. Yeah, that's it's got a few of them. Small. That's a great idea. And make it into a four banger if you need to, you know, just, just cause. Yeah, exactly. And like, you know, they're going to flip the switch and I'm sorry, how many bad guys are flipping switches on your, they're not trying to turn lights on. So even if they did, they just think there's something, how, how many times have you flipped the light switch and nothing happens? You never think, oh, there's probably a gun behind here. Yeah, um, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, you know, without spending hundreds of dollars and just be, like I said, be creative and, and, you know, you're not trying to outsmart someone. It's not like outsmarting someone. It's just being, you know, having place, having things staged in the house that are close by if the worst case scenario ever happens. And it's not outsmarting anybody. It's just being smart itself, you know? Yeah, seriously. Um, I've seen some really neat stuff. I guess it was on Instagram over the years. You know, I follow different people or what. And, uh, um, you know, how they'll sometimes suggest stuff to you. Um, but anyway, those maybe like corner units a lot of times, um, not desks, but like, uh, well, I guess sometimes they've been desks, but anyway, corner units, like big, you know, obnoxious wooden things that sometimes people have for their furniture. And then, you know, they'll have like the view of it where it's just kind of normal, like in its normal state. And it looks like uh, maybe a, what are those things called? China cabinets or something, you know, like for dishes or something. And you just, you know, you might sometimes go look at it and grab your dishes or your silverware or something. But, you know, then they'll have the second view, like on Instagram or whatever, where the, like the panels are all open and it has like all those little, you know, if you've ever looked at a big piece of wooden, or, you know, obnoxious furniture, there's all this dead air, you know, there's all this dead space in it for that mount moldings and stuff. And, uh, you know, these woodworkers know what they're doing. So they've, you know, they'll create like, you know, drawers and, and pullouts in these dead areas. So a regular person's gonna open a drawer and be satisfied that there's nothing they want. 
or they grab your candles, wherever the hell you keep your napkins. And then, uh, you know, they move on and they don't even realize that there's all these other places. And I don't know if that's necessarily for staging, but that could just be for, you know, hiding in plain sight kind of thing. You know, hide a I, of I've seen a there. bunch of people uh, put in like their, like their drawers where they put their socks or t-shirts or whatever. I've seen a bunch of people online that have done it, as, you know, they'll make like the bottom half of the drawer, like they'll put a piece of wood and you can put guns and, and magazines in there. And then you put the t-shirts on top of it. So if you just open a drawer, you don't know those t-shirts don't go all the way about to the bottom of that drawer. It might only be three or four t-shirts stacked up high, but to someone else, it looks like a full drawer full of t-shirts in retrospect on the very bottom of it, it's got two or three guns in there, you know? Yeah. Sometimes I think with that, though, you might feel it when you open the drawer, right? It's going to be heavier. It'll probably be heavier, yeah. But I've seen them where the drawer, like, they're, when, again, when they get uh, complicated or whatever, they'll have it where the drawer opens and then moves out of the way or something, and you got the second drawer. Yeah, I guess it could DTP be on hinges or something and just lift it up or something, you know? DTP saying they're going to pull the drawer out and dump it on the floor. I guess it just depends on the criminal too. And the thing is, sometimes when they're on those like casters or rollers or whatever the hell is like really nice drawers, you don't know. There could be like a million pounds in there. It just opens right up. And with heavy enough wood and stuff, you could mask a gun or two. Yeah, the other way is true. My, my dresser is really old and some of the drawers are stick. Like none of the drawers work great. So they wouldn't necessarily know anything. Oh, yeah. When they get kind of. Yeah. Well, they're because it's, you know older and it's antique because that's what my life my wife likes. They don't you know pull out none of the drawers pull out perfect now with I don't have any guns in it. I mean, it could be right. as low tech as putting a gun inside of a cereal box in your pantry. I mean, it's something as simple as that, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of place when we're talking staging where you know if your grandma or your ma or whoever it is is spending most of her time. You know, they're baking or fiddling around or in the sewing room or something. And I guess that was another thing I was going to mention um, when we were talking, just kind of hiding in plain sight. Um, they'd make them for automobiles, but I've seen them for houses too. But like a Kleenex box or like, you know, for like you'll get these like nylon uh, kind of sheets for a gun safe that'll say jumper cables on them so that, you know, it's like an inexpensive looking case. I'd probably just go to Harbor Freight and try to find you know, a cheap set of something and then, you know, that fits my gun box, but then, you know, just swap it out. So it looks like an inexpensive thing when they pick it up, even, you know, they're going to figure out this is $7 set of jumper cables. It's not worth stealing. Um, but I've seen them in like, at the you know, you have like a Kleenex box and like a little thingy like your grandma would make, but then you just kind of grab the Kleenex box and throw it away. And there's the gun underneath of there, you know, so it's, it's got some Kleenex on top, but you know, it's got a false bottom, like we're saying, and then that way, you know, who's going to necessarily knock over every Kleenex box that's sitting on a counter or sitting on a sewing table or something? My grandfather had to have a, uh, an umbrella case in the corner, and he had at least one small shotgun, a little 410 in there, and it's not like bad guys are going to come in and steal your umbrellas. Yeah. Yeah, I think you also have to understand that, you know, most criminals, I mean, let's, let's um, you know, I'm, I'm making a stereotypical thing here, but I'm, I'm most people that are going to break into homes aren't usually going after small things. They're going after TVs, you know, DVD players, gaming systems and all that. So chances are they're probably not going to be searching through the drawers. They're not going to be searching through the pantry. Like you said, they're not going to be searching through the Kleenex box and all that. And if you're in the house, then by the time they do start looking around, you should be able to, you know, be there, you know? Well, I'm going to disagree because I know that um, sometimes what you got is the neighborhood kid who sneaks in or the friend of the kid that lives there and or just some, I don't know, klepto or something where, you know, they're just looking for a, a wad of bills or something you might have in your drawer or they're looking for that ring or that watch, you know, something little that you're not going to miss. You know, not everyone is a strong arm, like, let's go in and just take whatever we can grab kind of thing. Sometimes they kind of milk you. They can get in and uh, grab something little. So if you got somebody just rooting around. 
That's true. I didn't think about that. Um, so let's go the other way. Um, I think we've been chatting about that one, but when we when I first threw it out there, um, Woods thought we were talking staging, like propping up a gun or setting up a little scenario for photographs. So we talked a bit about, like, I don't know if you're watching Matt's chat, but they did that gun porn. So we talked a little bit about some of the examples there, sticking the 50 BMG into the uh, trigger guard to keep it up at an angle so it looks better. Um, what else we talk about putting it like on like clearly like like, it's like uh, you know talking about actually like pegboards or something like that to where you actually display your guns. Is that what you're talking about? No, we thought we were talking about like staging a gun like for a photograph. So like, oh, I got you, I got you. Yeah, sure, sure. Talked a little bit you. about you know, using like a textured, colored background so that it absorbs light and you know gives you a better shots sometimes. But what kind of um, I mean, you you take pictures a lot of times, like while you're doing stuff or whatever. But I know you've taken stage pictures before. Yeah, I, I honestly, I personally, this is just me though. When I'm doing gun pictures and staging them for actual pictures, I like to be outside, get more of the natural light, and um, so I, I don't take a whole lot of pictures indoors of my guns because uh, I, I think the natural light outside and you know, putting it on the grass or putting it you know, somewhere kind of fun. Like, you know, I see a bunch on Instagram where they put handguns on like rocks by creeks and ponds and stuff. I think that's really cool. Yeah, I agree with you. The natural light is usually the best because there's so much of it. And then again, rocks is one of those things where, you know, it'll absorb the light around it. So the gun kind of pops a little bit. And when you got that background, obviously that's, I agree with you. That's you know, just add some story to the picture. Like, how the hell did he get out there? And why did he stick it there? It was neat. Uh, you know, it gives it more than just like, a, I don't know, sitting on a fence or something. Although, yeah. you know, put them on fences, and that can add a lot of interesting character to the background, kind of a consistent background, but at the same time, sort of that same idea of like getting the outside lighting and everything, you know, sitting on a fence. Yeah, there's there. I can't remember what page it is, but there's someone on Instagram that I follow that every day he's posting or she's posting, I'm not sure, but posting some kind of, you know, gun porn picture, but it's all in like natural settings. It's outdoors or it's, um, you know, all sorts of places. He'll put a gun, he'll put a gun like if there's a, a store that says, you know, has a sign, no guns allowed. He'll prop that gun up there on the door right next to that sign and, you know, stuff like that. But most of it's kind of like in everyday places, which I think is kind of cool also. I'm yawning and yawning, so I am going to try to figure out what the rest of the topics are. I think it was something else that I can't remember, so I'm going to go look. was, or it is, my internet's going out. Um, so they, if I sit too long in one space with this internet, they'll start to slow me down. Uh, how often do you practice is our second topic. During the school go year. Ahead, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. During the school year, I don't have as much time. So I really try to go once a month, but it's probably every two months. And then during the summer, I try to go every two weeks. I'm a range rat. I, I I try to practice at least two or three times a week, um, but I don't know, I live literally four minutes from my range, so um, I go when I can. And sometimes it's after work. Sometimes, honestly, it's before work, and um, so yeah, I go as much as I can. I I'm a range rat though. Well, I don't get to practice anywhere near as much as I probably should. Uh, DTP is saying, do you, are you including dry fire practice? Well, if you're doing dry fire, I, I try to dry fire every day for at least, you know, 10 minutes or so. I mean, it, it might be something as simple as on a lunch break or something that's in my office. And, you know, I, I can dry fire. I'll dry fire when I'm listening to other people's chats at night. Uh, I try to dry fire at least every day. But, uh, I mean, if you call that practice, then, yeah, I guess I practice every day. 
I'm probably not as good as every day, but I'm probably better part of five days a week trying to dry fire, but I'm kind of new to it. So I'm still trying to learn how to do it well. I never thought of it before I joined gun channels, to be quite honest. And then you guys taught me that like, I, Hey, this is something I should be doing. So you get another plug for gun channels to teach an old guy like me new tricks. <laughs> I tell you what a good way to do it is. And it's something very simple as watching. If even if you're watching a football game and it, and it works on just not just dry firing, but quick target acquisition, you know, pick out someone in a TV, you're watching it and they're moving around kind of switch from person to person on the TV and just try to pick up that target pretty quickly. It's something as simple as that. Well, luckily I'm mostly a baseball fan. They don't move very much, but I like the idea. Well, you can shoot the umpire. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Whenever I was first introduced to the concept, they always would make a big point of unloading because you want you to do it with your real gun because that's the point, right? So unload and then go to a different room and then not to shoot at the TV, mainly because you know there was an accident or you got distracted and you're shooting your TV. Um, so, you know, ideally you have some, I think, have you seen these little tiny sil uh, silhouettes that you get that are like an inch, you know, almost like a patch or something. And the idea is that if you uh, uh, sight in on them at a short distance, it's like, you know, basically the equivalent of shooting at a regular size one at 50 yards or something. You know what I'm talking about? though, like little mini versions of targets. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah. You can just kind of clip, uh, pin them up on the wall or something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then the idea would be like, if you've got a wall, that's like, I don't know, pointing at your garage or like out towards the backyard, you'd put them on the wall that, you know, behind it would be the least dangerous or what. But, um, I like those, that idea. I never did it enough, but, uh, I always thought that was a neat concept to be able to, uh, you know, have a target that you're familiar with pointing at, and then, uh, uh, you know, that whole concept of they're smaller. So uh, by the time you acquire a sight on that little tiny thing, it's basically the same as, you know, if it was further away so that it would seem that small. Uh, yeah, the was is, with the striker fire is, you know, re recocking it all the time. Yeah, there was someone on one of my chats a couple of weeks ago. He's a trucker, and there's several guys that drive trucks. I just can't remember which one it was, so I apologize. But there was someone saying that, uh, like, when they're at night, when they're having to do their mandatory sleeping, you know, through the day or the night, you know, they drive eight hours, they got to sleep so many times, or at least not drive, he'll sit back in the cab. And even as something as simple as putting a piece of duct tape on the top of the ceiling of the cab, you can get practice there and do some dry fire while you're listening to chats or whatever. So there's all sorts of ways you're creative to get practice. And even if you can't get to the range, dry fire is a very good solution to at least get some trigger you know, discipline, some muzzle discipline, you know, and all that stuff. So, yeah, I, I recommend dry firing as much as you can, especially if you don't get to the range very often. Taylor's jumping in from Michigan. We're talking how often you practice. I guess he didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> Personal question for some people. It um, is, yeah. I think he might have gotten out of his head. Could be. Sorry, I'm eating peanuts. Not the best thing to do on chat. Uh, what do you oh, go ahead, sorry, G. No, I'm just rambling. Go ahead. Uh, what do you guys think of, I've, I've been looking into some of those ones you get that you can put on your gun and your real gun and you can put the app so you can kind of shoot at your phone. Are those a good idea you guys think or not? Or I'm kind of like not really sure what that's all about. Shoot I at just your phone with like a laser? Yeah. I'm not shooting my phone. I'm not shooting my phone. I just uh, got one sent to me um, last week and I haven't got taken it out of the box yet. But yeah, it's, it's basically supposed to, um, if I understand what I'm reading about it correctly, is it's the little attachment that attaches to your gun and it's a phone app and you pull a trigger dry firing, you pull a trigger, it'll tell you how much movement you have and, and where, where you accurate, how much muzzle movement you had, um, you know, all sorts of stuff. So I haven't played with it yet, but the concept I think is awesome. Yeah, I was thinking of getting one, but they're they're not they're not super cheap. They're not super expensive, but you know, they're right into that area where you have to kind of think about whether you want to do that or not. 
Well, I'll tell you what, when I get done with this one, if I like it, I can always send it to you to play around with it. And then when you decide if you like it or not, you can always mail it back to me. But I have no problem with that. Um, if you want to try one out before you buy it, I'll, I can send it to you after I play with it for a little bit. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, no problem. All right. Well, I don't know if Tater's going to jump back in or not, but um, I'm going to suggest we do the member of the day. So. I usually do this right at the beginning of the show, but we're running weird tonight. So uh, anyway, I think we're going to feature uh, Dog Body. So uh, I don't know if you guys have been following Dog Bodies on the Instagram, but uh, oh yeah, pretty cool. He's been doing the, um, I don't know what you call that diet, where he eats meat and crazy butter and shit all the time. You can't necessarily say I agree with all of it, but it certainly it's interesting to follow you know, somebody that's sharing that. And then uh, he's out there right now on gun channels and uh, participating in our chat. I know he participates in other people's chats as well. And that's what we built gun channels for, people that want to hang out and actually participate. So uh, thanks, man, for being around. And he's also an excellent example, I think, of what we built gun channels for because he's not here every single day. Nobody in the right mind is able to do that, you know, to, to be here every single day. Everybody's got their own things going on, and he's had all kinds of stuff happening. But, uh, you know, he knows it's here, and he comes back, and you know, he's a member of the family, and that's what it's all about, is having, uh, you know, people on board who are interested and active. Uh, when we need everybody to get together, you know, they, we have a place to do it. And uh, when he's able, he jumps in, and uh, that's, that's fun. And yeah, I, 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 I told Yankee to shut up. So, <laughs> yeah, do, dogs is a good dude, and and I've been enjoying watching the the tra I mean, he's literally transformed his body in you know several months. That's it's pretty crazy. Like I said, I don't know if I could do that diet, but it's working for him. So, um, yeah, but yeah, the biggest thing about the Gun Channels family is, like you said, it's it's you don't have to be here every day and. And, um, but I think that the good thing is, is it's a great place to, if, like you said, if something needs to get out, it's a great place to kind of centralize our thought processes, get our message straight, and then attack with the message, whatever that is. And I think we, we showed in Wanamaker in April that, you know, the gun channels crew can take over when we need to, you know? Heck yeah. That's a good point. Um, so since I'm pretty sure dog body is out by Pahrump, uh, we, call this the daily gun show so because we talk about um oh and then i guess we should also talk about his dog let's call it dog body he's got that uh, pup that he's uh, always sharing you know the adventures and the training of as well thanks john for mentioning that it's kind of a given but i want to make sure we said something um how was i going uh Oh, so Dog Body is in Nevada, and we're calling this the Daily Gun Show because we like to do the show every single day when possible, at least every weekday, and eventually every single day. And uh, the reason we do that is so we can feature a new gun shop every day. Uh, I'm particularly fond of gun shops, uh, and we've, we've seen a lot of them. And uh, one of the projects I did before I could travel, like I'm doing now, uh, during the dark years of uh, trying to keep all everything going, I was able to get up to Vegas because that's a relatively easy uh, commute from, from Arizona. And uh, whenever the first um, recreational or what would you call them, like uh, tourist shops started or ranges started to open, I went up there and toured them. So uh, I think that was 2014 or, 15, or maybe 14. So um, maybe it was before that, whatever year it was, I can't remember. Uh, basically, though, I uh, knew somebody that had some time in a hotel up there that was going to expire, right? And uh, when you're close enough to a town like that, and they let you know, hey, I got, you can have a weekend up there if you want. Except it wasn't a weekend. It was like a Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday. It was some off time that nobody wanted to use, right? So I said, yeah, I'll drive up there. And I called ahead to as many of those um we're going to call them like recreational tourist um, rental ranges for the machine guns and uh, asked them if I could come by and get a tour and take a look. Uh, so a couple of them I called ahead and actually I found it was easier to just show up than call ahead. 
So I quit calling ahead and I just started showing up to them. There are quite a few. So I'm going to see, Ghost, you've only been to Vegas the one time or you've been there before? Well, I've been to Vegas a bunch. I've only been to SHOT Show the one time. But when I was in San Diego, my wife and I, we would go to Vegas at least once a month. So, yeah, we love Vegas. Okay. Did you ever have a chance to shoot at any of the machine guns or at least be aware of them, see them? I didn't. This was more in the in the mid to late 90s. So I didn't know of any that were around there back then. So I wasn't really looking for them. But, uh, no, I've never been to any of those uh, in Vegas at least. All right. How about Woods? Have you ever been to Vegas? Um, I'm kind of with uh, Ghost. It was back in the 90s, and to be honest with you, I wasn't looking to shoot anything. I was up to probably other no good, but I wouldn't have even have thought of it. John Z. Okay, so then um, I'm thinking back in the 90s, I definitely spent some time in Vegas, and what I remember back then is two of them. One is on the way out to Pahrump, and it's called – damn, I don't have the patch up here. I'm pretty sure that one is M – tell us the name of that one. I'll – I'll probably remember when I, I think it's the Vegas to Vegas shooting range or something. Um, but they use the Vegas welcome to Vegas sign that's on the highway or on the main strip there. And you know, that kind of themed one, they use that as their logo. And then uh, the other one is right on Flamingo or Tropicana. I forget whichever one's closer to the airport. And uh, it's called Flamingo. Flamingo. So it's called the gun store. And it's, you know, it's if you come out the airport, it's, it's the, it, you're going to get to it before you would even get to the strip. It's it's just take a right at the airport and go like a block or two, and you're right there. I so, never knew there was a range there. <laughs> Holy cow. That one, that's the gun store, and that's been there for a long, long time. The way you might know that one is when that show Pawn Stars was on, they would sometimes bring, you know, they'd have experts come to the pawn shop. Right. But that's why they would take a gun to an expert in Vegas, and that was that gun store. Oh, okay, the guy that wears like all the gold chains, and he'd come up and give the value of the guns and all that i don't remember the guy but it started out just being a store and then became a store with a range and there was rentals and i mean way back in the whenever i first started going to vegas um i remember that being there because i've you know guns so i'm like oh shit there's a gun shop so we went in and i don't know if you remember back well you guys didn't go there but back in the 90s basically across the street from there maybe a block towards the strip Something like that, there was a spy store. Remember spy stores where you could buy tiny oh, cameras? Yeah. Oh, and yeah. And that was the coolest thing because you didn't, I didn't know of any other spy store. Well, there was one for like a minute in Arizona, but anyway, that was there for many years. So I would always go check it out, just look at the weird spy stuff, you know, in person. Uh, anyway, so there's, uh, they've been around for a while. A couple of them have been around for a while, but like I say, whatever it was, it wasn't 12. So it had to be probably 14 or 15. Uh, I wasn't doing the show and tell so much on YouTube anymore. And I was mostly just getting into in, getting into the second amendment more, getting into our shooting communities and stuff. So um, I was curious about these. I've always been curious about the international tourism for firearms. I think that's one of the things that is underrated. It doesn't get talked about enough, but that's one of the ways that we can with our culture influence the rest of the freaking world. Right. So Vegas, international destination for pretty much the whole world and you know unique and interesting and everything and boom now all of a sudden we had um machine guns vegas mgv which is machine gun bb uh the blonde it's all a bunch of like they're not strippers but they're like really attractive hot chicks who do the um range officers and they're the you know they're basically they run the whole place uh so you know that's not necessarily just geared towards dudes. It's it's a bunch of girls running it. They just happen to be real hot. And I guess it's more comfortable for females. Like they'll have like a bachelorette party there or they'll have, I don't know, whatever female groups go there. Uh, and then that way they just have other females instructing them so they don't get mansplained everything. They get badge-splained everything. They like that. So um, there's MGV. Then you've got Battlefield Vegas, the big one that's behind Circus Circus where they've got tanks and some helicopter on static displays. Um, I think they might even have a plane and a whole bunch of vehicles that they don't really, they're more like static displays. They don't drive them around. But if you, um, because they're all competing with each other, they'll send out a Humvee. Uh, it's all got like a machine gun on it and stuff uh, right up to your hotel. Uh, a couple of them will send, you know, armored vehicles, but Machine Guns Vegas, I think, has probably the most of them. 
uh, and they make a big deal about it. Uh, they pretty much go pick anybody up in a armored vehicle because um, it's promotion right now. But I think that's cool. So anybody that wants to go to Vegas from any place in the world, you know, has an opportunity now to just basically make a phone call, get picked up, dragged over there. They pay a bunch of money and they get to play their hands on full autos and shoot them under supervision. And uh, that's kind of neat. So I'm trying to think. There's Range 702, which isn't, you know, a machine gun rental place, at least in the respect of some of the others that, you know, hang that as their only shingle. Uh, but they do have rentals, and I believe they have a couple of full autos. Uh, Range 702, though, is also international firearms tourism in this respect that they'll have uh, private parties there. You can have bachelor parties there if you're a celebrity or whatever. There's like, um, I haven't been to the new one, but I'm assuming it's like the old one. They have a separate range that doesn't have windows and stuff. So if there is some somebody who's whatever, doesn't want a bunch of people gawking at them, uh, they can come in their own entrance and have their uh, rentals or do whatever they're going to do and then leave and no one even knows they were there. So VIPs and there's anybody who wants to be discreet. Um, a couple of them have that uh, to offer. Uh, and Machine Guns Vegas has that as well. I don't think Battlefield Vegas has that. Um, let's see. So then, like I say, there's the two originals, the gun shop, which uh, it's, I think it's just called the gun shop Vegas. It's like the black and white um logos the one i was talking about on like tropicana i guess um that one uh has not just sat there being idle so as the other uh, i guess competitors came into town uh they got bigger so they bought the or at least they have the range behind them or the building behind them now and now the ranges are uh behind the old shop uh the old shop is rebuilt so it's outside looks the same but once you get inside it's all different it's all nice and fancy and now it's sort of a big eye shape like a capital i the, the front of the shop is the top of the eye there's this big long you know connecting thing the ranges of the other side of the eye and in that big long thing connecting them the hallway um, that's where you get the rental guns and they have a uh, as far as the different uh, rental places i think they have one of the more um, or i guess one of the less confusing setups so in other words you walk through the door as a non-shooter you pretty much have everything explained to you walk through this line talk to this person make this decision battlefield vegas is close but you kind of walk in the store and they're like hey here's a bunch of clothes like walk through all these what do they call those like little displays of shirts and stuff like walk through all this stuff that you can buy and then eventually you figure out at the back of the store you can get in line to rent the machine guns they don't really say like, come on down and rent a machine gun. Uh, so I don't know, it's just a little bit more, a little bit less confusing. That last one is on the way to Pahrump and I still can't for life for me. Is it the Vegas Gun Club or something? Um, can't think of the name of it, but um, they get the shaft because they're really far off the strip and it's more of a local range than anything else, uh, but it's a cool shop. So in other words, it's a local range because it's so far off the strip that they're really not competing with, you know, the heavy hitters, which are right there next to the strip or even on the strip. Um, so uh, it's a regular shop. They've got a lot of surplus stuff or they've, they've had in the past, at least lots of used guns. So if you actually go there to buy a gun or at least you're willing to entertain the notion of buying a gun, if it was a good deal, uh, they do have guns that are interesting for sale. Uh, lots of real useful stuff like holsters and magazines and mag pouches and I don't know, whatever else you might need for CCW lights and stuff uh, where the other shops are souvenirs. And I shot a full auto machine gun, you know, type of corny stuff. This place is a real gun shop and they have regular stuff. So if you're more of a shooter and you just wanted to uh, experience rental guns, uh, full auto rental guns, this, this one I'm talking about on the way out to Prump is probably more your style because it's just a regular gun shop they just also happen to have you know some interesting full auto rentals because they're in vegas and because they're trying to compete with those other shops they're also not trying to compete with the other shops in the sense that if you go in there you know you don't have to feel like a new shooter or something like you go in the machine battlefield vegas i don't care how experienced you are they're going to touch you and they're going to hold the your shoulder you know they're just insanely protective because they're so concerned about all the people that go in there that are completely not you know, knowledgeable. 
So they don't take anybody's word for it. And they, they're not just going to let you shoot. You know what I mean? They're going to always be right there. Uh, the other ranges are more chill because they're used to dealing with shooters. Uh, we didn't talk about the one that's right next to the stratosphere. And I think that's called the strip. Something about the strip. And that's the one that's kind of on the strip. And that's the weirdest one of all. Um, I've never been into it because of the parking's weird. And now it's got like in the same block. And this is, you know, the stratosphere, what I'm talking about, that big needle in Vegas. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the strip. Um, so it goes, I think, it, yeah, it goes most of Vegas. And then you get to the north side of the strip. And that's where it, historically it was all the cheap stuff, like the nickel slots and the quarters, you know, dollar blackjack and stuff. Um, that's like slots of fun and circus circus and Riviera. And then you have like this big dead area and then you get to the stratosphere. Then there's like a big dead area. There's nothing at the stratosphere except the stratosphere. And then you got like another dead area and that's where the pawn stars pawn shop is. And then you keep going North before you get to North Vegas where you can't carry anymore because they don't allow concealed carry in North Vegas. Um, you get to the old strip where the frontier is, I think, whatever those old casinos are called. So this stratosphere is sort of in no man's land between the prime time Vegas that most people are there for. And then the old Vegas. And, uh, so at the base of the stratosphere, there's a full auto machine gun rental place. And in the same parking lot, there's a McDonald's and now a marijuana store. So I think that's, I mean, why uh, wouldn't there be, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's America right there. So that's pretty neat. Obviously, you know, you pick the order that's appropriate for whatever you're doing there. But um, yeah, it's kind of neat. definitely a, a triangle of freedom right there. But I haven't been into that range yet. Uh, like I said, it's just weird to park there and get there. So uh, I haven't been into that one. So anyway, that's I know that I know that the Pawn Stars guys—they're all antique guns. But have you ever been inside the Pawn Stars pawn shop? No, I've only seen it from the outside. I think my brother wanted to go there a long, long time ago when it was still on. I don't know if that show is still on, but when the show was still like brand new, I guess, or whatever, a couple years old, and. We went past there and it was like uh, tourists like lying around the block kind of thing. And you know, you're not just going to walk in. You're going to spend right. most of the day waiting to, I guess, you go in there and you walk through it or something. I don't even know what you do in there. If there's a line you know, to get in, I can understand like, you know, go in there to um, buy something or whatever. And it might be crowded, but you know, if there's a literally like line around the block, I guess you just kind of walk in, you look and you leave. Assuming, otherwise it would really suck if everybody just goes in there and browses around and they let somebody out and let somebody else in they browse all around <laughs> yeah that would be fun i didn't know i didn't realize it was that crowded i didn't know there was like a line around there it makes sense well, but i didn't realize was, there was this was a long time ago i haven't been even past there in forever so uh this was this was a long time ago i don't even know how long that show's been on but it wasn't but it was definitely Years and years ago, because it's been a long time since I've been there with my brother. Um, of, of all your of all your favorites, I mean, of all the ones you've been in Vegas, what is your actual favorite like gun shop there? Well, that's a good question. So I've been thinking ranges, gun shop. I've been to a lot of the gun shops, and they keep changing. Um, probably the gun store. Still, the one that's that one that you talk a lot on Flamingo. Um, they had By some the airport. Stuff. Yeah. But if I'm remembering right, they had a really neat collection of police badges, like patches that somebody had brought in. And okay, so it's Vegas, right? And I don't know if you've ever been to any of the stores in Vegas. I also am interested in geology and rocks and minerals and stuff. So there's a couple of stores in Vegas where, because it's the desert, there's rock shops. But you know, insane prices. They do have really, really neat stuff. Maybe stuff carved, but you know, it's being carved by some slave in some third world country. It's not like some artist in Paris or something is carving a hundred of the same exact things, right? So they'll have like carved things and they have some really interesting, like, you know, rare, interesting looking or, you know, uh, exorbitant, large or something, crystals or minerals or whatever. Uh, and just insane prices because it's Vegas, right? Um, uh, hang on, what shop was I thinking of? I was going to say they, there's um, 
Hey, what shop was I thinking of? Because I said there's a shop and the prices weren't crazy. Oh, that's what it was. The damn the gun store. So I go into the to the gun store one year, and this might have been the year when they when I was doing the tour of all the shops. And you know, I'm a patch guy, so I notice that they've got a lot of police patches, right? And I'm not I don't have nothing against police patches. I think they're cool as hell. And I would have a collection of them if I would had some way of acquiring it, you know, cheap. But um, they had basically, it wasn't really picture frames. It was sort of like they were grouped in threes and they were like three for $10. And I mean, again, I'm thinking this is Vegas. You could probably charge anything for this. And even if it was insane, somebody's going to win a jackpot and walk in there and just, you know, and it's going to happen, right? It's Vegas. Billions of people coming through the town every year. A whole bunch of them are getting rich and running around spending their money like crazy. So I mean, it, it just would think that if any place in the play in in the world would have a, an outrageous price on a collection of police patches, it would be Vegas. And it was the opposite. Let's like, say you could have probably bought this whole collection of them for like a couple hundred bucks or less, and it was a lot. So um, anyway, I thought that was kind of cool, and I think that's indicative of uh, or that indicates you know a cool shop when they're not gouging when they could. Although that one that's out by Pahrump, man, it's, it's changed a lot over the years. If you would have asked me that question years ago, like when I went out to Front Sight for the first time, 2004 or something, their whole back room was surplus. And I would have said that store because it was basically a gun shop and a surplus store at the same time. Well, it doesn't um, get much better than that. Yeah, it takes forever to get out there. And their back room is now a training. Last time I was there, it was like their training classroom. And... You know how like when a surplus store will sell all their stuff, they're not stupid. They'll keep a couple of the cool things. Um, their training room had like, you know, remnants of the old surplus room, like, you know, samples or souvenirs or whatever you want to call decorations. Um, but, you know, not the same as when I can remember going into that room and everything was for sale. So, yeah, I'm going to say the gun, cl- the gun store. Plus, they do a cool Instagram and they seem to um, really be jiving on like the the international tourism and the people that not just international, but the people that come, you know, from this country that go to Vegas and then say, hey, I'm going to go shoot. You know, they're not battlefield Vegas. Battlefield Vegas is definitely for kids, like little kids or like foreigners who think that that's what we are all are like, but their, their crew all wear uniforms. I mean, they have more guns. It's more larger than any of the others, but it's definitely a tourist spot. It's not a gun range at all. It just happens to have a gun range in it for it's, you know, entertainment, but uh, you go there to for the experience of hanging out in such a exaggerated place. The uh, machine gun Vegas, unless you're a guy or a girl who's trying to get you know, not mansplained to, you're not going to go to that one. And it's not on the strip; it's way off. Well, it's way off the strip. Um, I'm forgetting about the one that's south of MGV. I can't remember the name of it. Um, and that one's a, a competitor uh, with the gun store and i was gonna say the gun store is more like just people wearing black shirts it's a regular old gun shop that has expanded over the years but it's still just a regular old gun shop and like i say their whatever you want to call a procedure to get to a rental gun is very clear cut so i think that they do a great job of being ambassadors to um you know just shooting in general uh they're not trying to uh, make everything super technical or entertain anybody with, you know, the outrageousness of their shit. And um, they don't, you know, they're not the opposite. They're not just so laid back that it's dangerous or anything. Like they're attentive and they're there and their people are competent, but they're not hovering over and you making you feel like an idiot if you're familiar with what you're doing. So I'm going to go with the gun store. I'd say what I'd like to do is if you've got time and we both have time, but you know, next January, if we've got a little bit of time one of the afternoons, I'd love to go to that gun shop and just hang out for a little bit, you know, get away from SHOT Show and relax a little bit. Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to spend more time there so that it's not like rush in, rush out. And uh, right. that's the perfect thing. We usually, when for years there, for years, when the whole crew was going up, we would go up a week early and we'd come home at our leisure. And that was so that we could go to a different show. There's another show there the weekend before for like surplus stores. I don't know if you got to that. I don't think you got to that one, but there's like a tiny version of shot show for surplus stores. So it's like 
people from Bulgaria are there and people from Romania are there and people from all these weird countries are there selling their weird shit and surplus stores walk around with little clipboards and go, okay, I'll take like 2000 of those shovels and 5,000 of that weird strap and give me two tons of green things. You know, they just buy weird shit. It's an, it's an interesting show. Um, so we would go to that and then we'd stay after for the antique gun show. And then, you know, because we're there longer, and you know me, I would want to whip through as many gun shops as possible. So there's American Shooters. We didn't even talk about that one. I forgot about that one. Uh, American Shooters is all like stainless steel and glass and diamond plate. So it's its own like style. Um, it's it's a regular gun shop and it's in Vegas, not on the strip. But then they also cater to people on the strip like because they're close enough to be able to do it. But um, unlike the gun store they act like everything's fancy and like, I don't know, we polish everything and it's all stainless steel and all the guns are behind glass. I don't know what they're trying to prove. It's just a little bit too like Austin for me, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, the gun store is more like San Antonio and the American shooters is like Austin. Like they're the same thing, but one of them is just trying to put on a little bit too much airs for me. And I feel like I'm paying for something I don't need at that one. Uh, the other one's not trying to impress me. Um, but yeah, that we, we would run around and basically we would look at it like a clock. And one year we would do like Northwest section of the town. The next year we would do like, we never even got to Henderson. So Southwest. Um, and there's ranges down there I haven't even been to. And um, Amenez, you guys like to make fun of Amenez so much. They're in Henderson. Now, the range that we went to uh, to range day at, is that an actual working range outside oh, yeah. of range day? Yeah, that's a massive range. That's the Boulder City Rod and Gun Club. And that the reason they do media day there is because it was such an established large gun club. It used to be in the middle of nowhere, but now they're making that bypass highway right on top of it. So that's going to drastically alter it. I don't know what they're going to do. They'll do something they'll just shoot away from it i guess or they'll give it must have given them new land because they took a big chunk of their side of them i think i mean that highway looks like it's right on top of shotgun ranges almost so i don't know if they're just going to shoot shotguns into the side of the highway you know like that hill that the highway is under right or, right. or if they're just going to angle everything and start shooting more south but um yeah that's been an established range for a long time thing is it's in stupid boulder city which is another one of the cities you can't carry it so it's, Nevada has cities and towns that are older than the state. And then you don't get, what's that called when the state overwrites city laws? I can't think of that term. You know what I mean? Where some states like Arizona, it doesn't matter what the city says, the state wins. Like the state always, state law always trumps city law. In those, some of these states out here where the cities are older than the states. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Huh? Superseding? No, there's a word for that. Yeah, we have it in Washington. But um, anyway, so they told them, well, we'll join your state, but we're keeping our laws. And North Vegas and Boulder are the two cities that you have to worry about in Nevada. I don't know. There's probably more, but you know, in the middle of nowhere, nobody cares about. But those are right next to Vegas, and you can't carry it, even with the Nevada carry permit. So that's annoying. Um, but other than that, that's where I think they do all their EPSIC and IDPA. Preemption, thanks, state preemption, thanks to Adelpo. Are we saying that right? Yeah, preemption is yeah. Oh, and then Cycle Camp said it also. Cycle's out there. You know? Yeah, by the way, welcome to the Gun Channel, Stanley Adifo. Uh, he was on my chat last night. It's the first time I'd seen him and all that, but welcome to the Gun Channel's family. Yeah, I was almost going to make a member of the day, but then I figured that'd be weird. It'd be the first day there. <laughs> day member of the day. Yeah, yeah. I was text chatting yeah. with him. you. Contacted me to come on here, G. So, yeah, you, you don't want to, you know, give him the big head too quickly. You know, he's you got to make him earn it in at least a couple days. Well, so was, now we're going to talk about health for a minute. So, you know, these little air fresheners where they look like uh, kind of like a goofy giant egg, and you kind of twist them, and the, the two pieces of shell come apart, and then there's some kind of goop in there, some pudding or something that smells and then it makes everything smell like whatever that pudding inside smells like you know what i'm talking about you get them at the i got mine at the dollar store yeah yeah you ever use one of these things air freshener type of thing 
I haven't, but I use I use use like one of those little things that hang on your mirror. So I'm not real high tech on it. Well, that's what I should have got. I think. So anyway, this dog stinks. I stole a stinky ass dog off of Russ. So I got one of these air fresheners, and for the dog, the other dog, uh, you know, I had one in the van, and it was fine. But anyway, it must have worn out or whatever. This dog's just more stinky. So I got another one at a dollar store. Paid a dollar for it. It's not like I bought a fancy one or nothing. And I cracked that thing to the lowest possible because I can't stand smelling smell shit. And this is supposed to be like clean laundry smell. Anyway, I cracked it to like the smallest possible thing I could crack it to. And I think I died. I almost died today because of it's so overwhelming in here. So I closed <laughs> the back up. And I think I'm having an allergic reaction to it or else I'm sick. But yeah, I can barely breathe. I think I'm having an allergic reaction because I can, I mean, it's, it's a way it's like closed and put away and I can still, it's like driving me nuts. I can smell it so bad. So I think I'm one of those like weakling chemical allergy people that like not live in a bubble or something now. Uh, you need to I'll tape a, a right guard regular to your dog's butt. That's all. I'm going to do something. Yeah, maybe put like I could wrap her in like a diaper made out of uh, dryer sheets or something. I'm gonna start calling you Bubble Boy. I'm gonna get a bubble, I think. Or I started sp smoking this robot cigarette thing that I got conned into buying because it's twenty bucks only, and maybe it's killing me. Like maybe it's got some kind of chemicals in it that are driving my lungs to shrivel up or something. Are you trying to quit? <laughs> No, I just was sick of buying. I went to Chicago. Do you have any idea how much cigarettes cost in Chicago? I can only imagine. Yeah. It was like twelve dollars for cheap ones and like eighteen for good ones or something. Oh my god! Are you serious? I don't remember where like all the counties are and shit. Yeah, it was insane. I didn't even buy cigarettes. Luckily, Clover sent me that pipe, right? So I've been smoking that pipe. But you know, I'm going to the guards policy conference. I'm not going to smoke a pipe. So um, anyway, I was like more of a cheap thing. I'm like, man, I spend a lot of money on cigarettes. I'm going to buy this thing. And, he, and I was at the store and the guy let me hit his and it was hit like a regular cigarette. I don't know. I did a whole show on it yesterday. They're about the size of like two packs of like, you know, regular cold fashioned gum. That's like a big rectangle. So it's a very small thing, but anyhow, something's killing me. I can barely breathe. But cycle just jumped in. We talked about a couple of things. Staging guns. You want to throw anything on that? No, I don't stage any guns around the house because I carry one with me all the time. Well, that's adding something. How about uh, the other interpretation of staging guns uh, for uh, setting them up for photographs? Well, I mean, I, I you know, I put them on the, you've seen the big oak top uh, desk and, uh, and the blue, uh, the blue uh, bedspread. That's about it. I have a lot of respect, though, for the guy that does all the really artsy fartsy ones, where like you'll stick a knife in a tree and put a gun on a knife, or he'll put them on a rock, or you know, in, in Instagram or there. I, uh, that that's, you know, that that's talent, man. I don't have that kind of talent. That's really nice. Well, now you're talking Chris Steele, and I met up with him in Denver, and. Uh, everybody except Woods, who refused to do it, but Ghost and Cycle have both signed the poster that Chris also signed. So y'all three are poster buddy brothers. Right oh, cool. on. Woods, Woods refused to sign the book. Oh, he was one. He was one up fee uh, a fee up front. I'm sure wasn't he signing bonus? Well, he just refuses to drive down and sign it. <laughs> Careful what you ask for, GM. Just might get. I get Simmers off. <coughs> right well, it's, it's funny you were talking about the, the tobacco being so expensive so i just got back from norway as most of you guys already know and the two things they tax the most are booze and cigarettes because they don't want their people smoking and they don't want them drinking now and do you, people smoke there anyway or is it like a smoke there's nobody smoking no there there are some people that smoke but it's very expensive and the uh and the uh, like, like if you have a a regular beer, it's you know like nine bucks. And if you have an, a non-alcoholic beer, it's like four bucks. It's the same. Like non-alcoholic beer costs the same as like milk, you know, for kids. 
I don't drink very often, but I have had a, whatever that fake beer. And I don't understand that. It tastes exactly like regular beer, I think. So why would anybody want to drink that if they're not getting drunk from it? Right. Oh, I, I do that because when I ride the bike, I won't I won't drink alcohol when I'm on the bike. Yeah, but I'm saying, why would you want to? I'd rather drink a soda or something. Why would you want to drink a gross beer? Oh, I like, well, because I like the taste of beer. Oh, okay. Now, were there a lot of bars there or not really? Oh, Christ, yes. God, there's okay. bars everywhere. Okay, so, so they're just accustomed to paying high prices. Yeah, the fact that it was expensive, you know, maybe it was all us tourists doing all the drinking. I don't know. But the, but the, and there's a lot of microbreweries and stuff, and they're really good because they don't they don't pasteurize their stuff and they don't filter it. So the beer, it's kind of like drinking in England. It's really decent. It's Do pretty they much like it. cold beer there. It's it's uh it's not ice cold. You know, it's more it, it's more like the the uh, the cool cellar kind of stuff. You know, unless it's like an IPA or something, and then it's kind of cool. You know, it's kind of cool. It's all room temperature, but it's Norway, so. Yeah. <laughs> the rooms are a little chiller. Yeah. I did not so, go. Some of the people on the trip went to that ice bar. I did not do that. I I uh, was busy what? doing other things. You mean but the one was... where they just carve it all out of ice and, like, all the cups and beds? Yeah, and yeah. Ice? Yeah, you get to keep the glass. <laughs> I would have gone there just to see what it's like to be in a giant, like basically ice igloo, right? Except the yeah, place. I was busy doing, you know, I was I was going to like wine and cheese tastings and stuff like that. So oh. now is oh, so you were going pickup. through the wine tastings, were you? Oh yeah. Is this one of those countries where everybody starts drinking when they're like fourteen? No, not really. Okay. Well, it was fun. It's a good time. Um, now back to reality. Yeah, it sucks. What was our other topic? Um, oh, how often do you practice? I, you know, I don't practice. I shoot matches, which is probably not very good practice. So, so technically, I practice once a month when Ghost comes out with his uh, targeted of the week, <laughs> targeted of the month, because that's the only time I ever like step off the line and get like up close and personal. Cause most of the time I'm shooting at 20, like tonight I shot at 25 yards and I got two ninety fives and two ninety sevens out of a hundred. So I felt really good, but the good guys are getting like 99s and a hundred. So yeah. Well, oh, well, so I do an awful lot of shooting, but I don't do, I, I wouldn't consider that concealed carry practice per se. The only thing I did for concealed carry practice was we had our, our bug gun match, and I use my everyday carry for that. I actually took second place, but uh, but it's a uh, you know that's the only thing I would consider actual practice because we do shoot uh, uh, rapid fire as well as uh, slow fire, and so that that really makes a big difference in the scores. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess I've gone through my own opinions on stuff. But I think that in reality, most of us are never going to get into gunfights and everything. So to some extent, preparing for the worst eventuality um, constantly, can, you know, it's tough to justify that. On the other hand, I cannot justify never, you know, just assuming you're never going to get anything. So never, try, you know, never practice at all. But I guess what I'm getting at is um, even whatever kind of competitive shooting you might be doing, you're learning things, not necessarily how to react in a gunfight or whatever, but you're experiencing malfunctions, you're experiencing what works and what doesn't with technique and yeah, establishing a sight picture, you know. Yeah, and and, 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 and I'll be the first one to admit if if me surviving depends on a uh, uh, one and a half second draw, I'm screwed. <laughs> you know, that's, that's it. <laughs> I mean, besides the fact that I'm old and fat, you know, I, I just, I'm just not going to do that. But if I have a half a chance to get my gun out and get it sighted, I think the guy's going to have a very bad day. Yeah. I would say don't sell yourself short. One of the neat things about the front sight training, which is just a carbon copy of the gun sight, uh, basic pistol or advanced pistol is that they'll, we walk away from the either whatever two or four days 
uh, shooting 1.7 second double shot, whatever center of mass headshot thing. So I forget what the actual numbers are, but you get pretty fast. And when the beginning of a couple of days, you go, oh, that's you know, that's 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 fancy trick shooting or whatever. That's Mick quick stuff. But once it's like anything, once a coach who's you know proficient in in explaining this the techniques and the very various things, and then you go through enough uh, um, range time so that those coaches can then look at the individuals and give you indiv- you know actual advice on your whatever technique or whatever. Um, it's not real hard to get. I mean, I, I've seen more than once, often, I should say, um, whole bunches of people, you know, whole entire classes, 20s, 20 people, dozens of people achieving that. So it's 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 just like braking or, you know, driving or something. You might say, oh, I could never balance on a bike. And then once you do it for a minute or two or, you know, a couple of times, you figure it out and you know how to do it. Yeah. yeah. And, anyway. and I will say your question earlier about staging guns. I do stage a gun every night. Because every night I take my bedside gun out of my little safe and I put it on a table next to the bed. So I do stage a gun, but only at nighttime. And what I do, I don't know if a lot of people do this or not, but like when I go to bed at night, I don't like strip my pants and throw them in the, in the laundry. I fold them up and I put them on a chair in case I have to jump into them again in a hurry. And my carry gun is always in my pants. So I always have a gun in my pants and I have my everyday carry gun. I mean, I have my bedside gun, which is a much bigger gun. It's obviously like a 17 rounder, you know, with a light and all that kind of crap. And I take that out of my little miniature safe and put it next to the, to the bed. So that's the extent of my staging guns, but I don't like, you know, put a gun tucked into the, to the, you know, the sofa or any of that kind of stuff. I don't do any of that kind of crap. Right on. So it's a couple of things there. You mentioned the gun in the pocket. So you leave like your flashlight and your knife and cell phone in the pockets as well. Well, a cell phone goes on a charger. Uh, the only knife I carry is a multi-tool and uh, I don't carry a flashlight on me. I'm one of those evil people that don't carry a flashlight on. It's crazy. I don't know how you're alive, but anyway, I like the concept <laughs> of having a pants stage. I mean, that's a that's a decent theory there. Um, I think I've talked about Masadi one time said having, I think for travel or maybe he said for his regular veggies to have like a, a vest or something like a Dano vest or even a soft armor or something. But basically, uh, you put your firearm, your flashlight, your cell phone, your keys, and you might have had some other things, but basically maybe a tourniquet. But anyway, you put all that stuff and like you say, you can just dodge, you know, put that right on. So if you get like your Dano fishing vest, you get like a robe or something with some pockets. I just bought a pair of sweatpants. It's cold as fuck here. And these sweatpants have zipper pockets. I've never seen such a thing. So, um, oh, wow. Yeah. You oh, yeah. The zipper pockets are the jam because you can put little things in there like Apple iPods and stuff like that that fall out of your pockets at a moment's notice. And those things are awesome. Well, I'm thinking about for a night, though. put like a set of keys in there and uh, you know, if you have to jump in there. Anyway, so I like that idea of having a uh, pants stage. That's, that's another. Is, is Hosh muted? No, no, he just said stuff. You didn't hear him? I'm here. Oh, I'm Copy. sorry. I'm, 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 no, I'm looking at the wrong. The Hangouts got messed up and I was looking at the, you know me, I got the three screens all up at once and I'm looking at the wrong one. So it's delayed a little bit. Sorry. No worries. So I'm gonna jump over to Hosh. We uh, you just jumped in. We've been talking staging guns. You got a different situation with uh, your location. Plus you got limbs. Oh, yeah. You so you got, right? got people. Yeah. So I, I've got the you know the, there's a law and you gotta keep guns safely secured from children. Uh, so I have a a safe that I keep most of my firearms in. And I have a bedside biometric safe, which is keyed to all my fingers and my wife's fingers that the Glock is in. The Glock has a light on it. Um, I usually have a gun in my pocket. And if I don't, um, then I do have a pocket knife. But I always have the pocket knife regardless of whether the gun is in that pocket. But if the gun is in that pocket, nothing else goes in that pocket. Uh, For me, I have a staging area, I guess you'd call it. There's a little shelf. Um, that has a handkerchief that I put things on 
and it's usually um, although I switched my ECD uh, my EDC light out um, I started going with the floodlight I picked up one of those brass uh, side shot floodlights this thing's awesome it's just like that Meritac AAA one I normally carry this thing is awesome how does um, that work with a two-handed grip yeah yeah it's not good no it's not good for that and and I, okay. I wouldn't I wouldn't advise you to to use your pocket gun necessarily for that you probably have a light on your gun or whatever but I know there's different thoughts on that um, cool thing about this so I'll, I'll turn it on really quick so I'll turn it off and the inside glows so when you hit it you hit that with the with the light its own light and then you can put it on your nightstand and it glows for a really long time which is nice so if you need it you can find it pretty easily that's kind of you cool. can reach out and grab it in the dark yeah so as far as like the quote unquote go you know your vest with all your stuff on it um, generally that's my messenger bag or my backpack I don't go anywhere without a bag of some kind and I have multiple bags and that will have uh, a radio if if not one two radios some kind of medical thing um, usually a, a tool set of some kind whether it's a screwdriver or um, I've been carrying a little a little crescent wrench, a CR, the CRKT something or other that has the bits in it too. So you can do screwdriver stuff with it. And it's got a blade. That's a utility thing. So that stays in the bag. Um, pretty much my wallet, all that stuff goes in the bag normally because it, you just grab it and you go. And it, it, for me, I've got to have like a, a process. Like I've got to have something I go to every time, like a, um, what do they call that? Um, a tradition, if you will, a tradition that I, I wake up, get ready, and I grab the bag and I go. So if I'm if I'm without the bag, I I know I don't have what I need, and everything goes back in the bag so that I have what I need. That's yeah, you're establishing thing. muscle memory. Yeah, exactly. So what is that new cigarette thing you're using? What brand? Uh, the Jewel. That's what I got. All right. Yeah, they make they big. make uh, pods called Zip Z I P P that are um they fit this thing and they're like half the price oh that's good to know at gas stations or where i think some uh i've seen them at smoke shops i haven't seen them at gas stations but you can buy them online for even cheaper because it's free shipping oh, and it's online right now but okay the gas stations. yeah 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 and then so that's it's a it's a good deal that way okay and then uh uh what flavor are you using is there more than the four that come in the sample pack? Sorry, say again. What flavor are you using? Mango. Okay. Mango and, and, and did you get the thingy that's like a big rectangle that you plug it into and it you know can charge off of the thingy? Yeah, uh yeah, this guy. Is it worth getting? The guy at the store was trying to sell it to me. I don't know if he's upset. Oh no, I just use these guys, the little dongles no, they no, come no, with. That thing. Not that thing. There's like a metal thing that you plug this whole thing into, and it makes it a little larger, and then it can run for four times as long. Oh, I don't know about that. 20, um, 20 but I mean, at, at the same time, I've got like three or four of these little batteries, and I just swap them out. Oh, okay. This guy said that it made it for him. He kept losing it. So by putting it in the bigger thing, you can you know keep track of it easier. It's about the size of like a credit card that you put it into. Oh, I mean, if you're going that way, there's plenty of other pod-based vapes that do the same thing. It's you know, you you can get you can find them. Um, actually, what I, you know, what I have been doing, one of the things I, I like about the 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 jewel is it's it's a magnet on the bottom, and so yeah. I keep one of these little cheapy uh, torque uh, wrenches for chokes for shotguns on my desk, and then I just I just hit it on that, and then that's when I'm when I'm yeah, so I don't. Thing. Yeah, so I just I just throw that on the, the desk and hit it and, it, and it sits there, and so it's perfect. Yeah. Okay, we can quit narrow casting. So uh, General Relativity is saying FDA is about to put the smackdown on e-cigarette vape mods within the next 50 days, considering banning them entirely, but trying not to. Why? I, 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 why? Like, I don't understand. Is big tobacco strong again? Like, what what is the reason? I, I don't understand. If people get off of cigarettes, isn't that a good thing? Nicotine is relatively safe. It's addicting, but it doesn't really have any long-term health um, issues like cigarettes do. So, what are they proposing as a replacement? I, I just don't. I don't get it. You well, think I they're think making I, the nicotine 
in the lab or do they get in the nicotine out of like Marlboro cigarette or Marlboro tobacco still? Well, I think the issue is not the nicotine. I, I think the issue is that the the vape companies and the, the oils are using for the vape. They're doing the same shit that the cigarette companies did. And they're putting all other kind of chemicals in there to, no. make, to, make, to make it more tasty and desirable and addictive. Yeah, but that's the, but that's not that's not really true. I, I, that's not true. It, it they're not doing anything other than adding flavoring, and the main ingredients are PG, propylene glycol, and vegetable glycol (VG), and those are both inert to humans. And and even if they do have a negligible detriment to humans, it's still better than smoking cigarettes. So, I mean, many doctors, you can talk to me, don't, don't trust me, go talk to an actual doctor and say, like, if, if I was either going to vape or smoke, what would you prefer I do? They'd say vape, because it's, it's like way less harmful to your body, way less harmful. Hmm. And I know, I know there was a study done in Japan, and the Japanese study showed that uh, under certain conditions, it would put out a large amount of, um, uh, oh, I'm not ready for all these terms in my head. Um, the, the stuff they embalming fluid. Um, so what is that? What is embalming fluid? Formaldehyde. Somebody. Formaldehyde. There you go. So yes, that's true. But the study had to heat the coils up to the point of basically turning the metal to the point that it became molten before formaldehyde came out of it. And nobody's vaping at those temperatures. Nobody's doing anything um, and sucking on it and breathing it at those temperatures. So it's it's kind of like, yeah, I can I can I can make all kinds of horrible vapors come out of something if I if I make it under extreme heat, but that's not what people do with these products. They're not doing that. So it's kind of like you're stating the obvious, but also you're totally misrepresenting what people are using those products for. Hmm. Relatively saying, FDA gave companies 60 days, 10 days ago, to prove they can keep them out of kids' hands. They're considering letting the dropping of fruit flavors slide, but if that doesn't work, they will ban them. That's messed up. You know what will happen if they ban them? They'll still exist and everybody will still be vaping. Well, we'll just all go to we'll just all go to refilling our vapes with juices. Like you can, I don't know if you know this, G. You can you can take the little black top off of this and you can refill them. Oh, good. And so what I do some occasionally is I'll have a, a vape juice that you can You're buy that's yeah. that's salt, you know, salt nicotine, which is what's in the the, the jewels, and then you just refill them with the with the little dropper. That goes back to the old school dropper days when you, you know, had the big mod and you'd toast that. That's where you get the big fat clouds is when you had a mod. Dang it. Jewel was specifically cited because of their popularity. As soon as I bought one, they make them illegal. Sons of bitches. I mean, isn't that uh, life, though? Isn't it every time you get into something, the government finds out about it? And like, I'm not getting in enough money from this. How do I how do I get my piece? I need I need a piece. Well, I appreciate everybody dealing with the sidetrack there, but. A new Kosh had had one. I thought it was a different one. For some reason, I thought it was a little more square than this one. But anyway, Oh, yeah, I've got multiples. Um, in fact. No, that's all right. We don't have to keep talking. It, 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 operates, it operates on the same. Um, this is the cartridge for it. It operates on the same concept. It It's salt nicotine, which is different from the traditional vapes. Um, oh, and they're a little tiny. Different. What's oh, up? That's why they hit differently then. No, it's the same. Oh, oh, that's why they hit. Yeah, so vapes, uh, salt nicotine vapes hit differently than regular vapes. Yeah, maybe definitely. That's very soon. Anyway, so I, I was not okay. Uh, yeah, we, we can move on. <laughs> yeah. So I got everybody's attention, and I'm changing shit up. So did everybody see Kevin's video, um, where he took the kids to CMMG? Uh, Knives posted it on the front page of Gun Channels earlier today. No. Um, so, uh, Ghost, are you still around? You still awake? Yeah, I'm still here. Barely, but I'm here. Yeah. Um, you got a cool story about Kevin. Uh, I just barely met Kevin. Not, I mean, I didn't even say I met him. I shook his hand and said, "You can have my, uh, you know, channel to do as you will." But um, uh, 
I got to listen to him speak twice this last weekend, but Ghost has a better story. So if you would give us a like a bio of Kevin, what you what you know of him. I mean, he he was uh, he was in law enforcement for a time in St. Louis and got into training and all of that. And he's a really good trainer, but um, he's really in, entrenched into the community. And what I what I my favorite story of him is this is earlier in the year sometime. He he went to an elementary school, and I don't know if it was third or fourth or whatever, but it was elementary school. And he went to this class, I guess, that tested very highly in. Um, their testing scores and bought him pizza, took him, you know, the little pizza party can congratulate him and all that. And was just talking to him. But at the same time, the whole time he was wearing a gun t-shirt and he wasn't making it about guns. He's talking to eight, nine year olds, but what he was doing is trying to expose them to something and make it not scary. And the way he goes about the way he does things, I think is really ingenious because he, he can get in your face and he can, you know, speak the truth but he's also trying to bring a community together and saying look in st louis guns are prevalent and sometimes they're looked upon as bad things in st louis but i'm a gun guy and i'm here to support the kids and i'm going to try to do it in a way that i'm you know subconsciously showing you that a gun person is not a bad guy so i think it's it's really ingenious how he's trying to do things Yeah, yeah, and I was uh, impressed with his, I guess, talk at the AMCON, which was the two-way media kind of get together. And he had never, you know, it was only twice that they, this is the second year of it, so he wasn't there last year. This was his first experience at it, and uh, I'm finally getting his uh, channel over here for us. Um, uh, but what he, I thought, what I thought was cool uh, is, you know, we're there for. Uh, learning how to uh, or to to help each other or work together towards getting Second Amendment related content out there. And uh, his um, sort of uh, input was to um, trying to remember exactly what he said the first day was to to understand where the audience is coming from. And um, because he had he was in a panel with other people who had talked about some of the topics he was going to talk about. He, he kind of went off script and it was just interesting. He, he talked a bit about uh, his philosophy of education and he doesn't go straight to guns. So if his goal is to uh, bring on more shooters and to get more people involved in the second amendment and shooting and whatnot, um, he'll take the approach of going to their, you know, it's in St. Louis, like you said, so go to neighborhoods and uh, have discussions, go to meetings and things and uh, empower people to um, just do better in, in life, period. And help them. Uh, he was quite proud of, uh, he helped reunite some families and get fathers back with families, you know, doing hands-on stuff, um, helping, uh, I guess, inspire people, not just to shoot, because you know that's that's one tool in an inventory, but to uh, just appreciate their, what they've got to offer, and then to uh, get some training on maybe uh, interviewing skills or something, and then get get a, a job and work with these people instead of just offering advice from a podium or whatever. But you know, work with the community groups and with uh, you know getting out there and, and going to different levels of um, I guess individual or more group type stuff but anyway working with people to uh have some uh he would he phrased it uh, equity in their own lives and then once they've uh kind of once he's helped them to um have some ambition and some uh something to protect then start talking to them about All right now you've got you know something to protect let's talk about how you can protect that and what rights you have and what options you have and he doesn't just go straight to it i really think he's got an interesting um i, I guess you'd call it a hobby because i mean as like you said he was a cop and he decided that you know of all the different avenues he could take this was the way he was going to do it he has a firearms school you can take classes uh, those i think you've got something scheduled with him later in the year uh, dano will be training with him at some point and 
Uh, so you can go just take firearms classes with them. But instead of like a lot of firearms instructors who are satisfied with teaching skill set to people who are already interested, um, he's got a real interest, a personal interest to uh, empower communities and individuals in communities that often are neglected. And I just thought that was awesome and inspiring. So um, I wish I would have known about him earlier. Uh, I'm going to link to his channel here on uh, our stuff and uh, encourage people to check out that video today where basically took a bunch of kids. Uh, he arranged it with CMMG, which is, I guess, somewhere near there. It's in Missouri, I think. And uh, uh, took them to their factory so they could see hands-on what a factory is like, what the kind of machines are like, what kind of tasks and jobs people do at a factory. And then, of course, it's a gun factory, so they're talking about you know, barrels and pearls, I think, because he always has it. Um, anodizing, they talk about projectiles and stuff. And these are just glimpses at what probably was at least a, you know, half a day or more. Uh, but they went and did a factory tour. The head of the uh, company, CMMG, and his daughter made lunch for everybody. And then uh, uh, they said a prayer before they ate lunch. So it was, you know, more than just your typical, let's get on a bus and take the factory tour and then get back and eat your lunch and go back to school. This was uh, kind of a cool um, look at this experience that we brought these kids. And that's just super cool. So uh, thanks to Knives for posting it. And I guess I've been saying it, but I'm going to drop the link to his channel. And... Uh, you're going to see a lot more, I think, from Kevin and some of the other people I met at the, at the Gun Rights Policy Conference. So that'll take us into the next step, which might be boring, but um, I'm going to end the show today with a question that we can chat about as long as it takes to chat about it, because uh, I think we've already blown whatever kind of schedule we've got here. Um, what can we do? What can we do to further the second? What can we do? I'm leaving it open and we'll get more specific in future days, but anybody that wants to tackle that one, ponder on it, whatever. I think it's just really, really important that, you know, we talk about the gun life or the culture and how we incorporate it in our own lives. I think it's very, very important to obviously be responsible, be safe with our firearms, but to really put off into the public that people, you know, we're around people all the time that, aren't gun people or whatever but if we show them that we're just normal people and i think it's very important to just say that we're normal people we're normal citizens we're law-abiding citizens we have normal jobs we're we're coaches in the community we're fathers we're daughters we're sisters we're brothers and we just happen to like guns it's just like any other thing that people are passionate about in their lives whether it's music or wine or whatever our passion is guns and i think that once they realize and make it a personal thing and say it's not dangerous. It's just that's what we are. Maybe we can start changing minds and say, you know, I know a couple of gun people and they're just like us. So maybe the guns aren't scary. Maybe it's, you know, just so it's a tool that they use. It's a hobby that they use. It's a passion that they use or whatever they want to say. But I think just trying to put out there all the time that we're normal people that carry every day just proves that, you know, guns aren't scary, you know. Can I piggyback off of that? Yeah. Uh, as a teacher, I've always been pretty clear with my kids that I hunt. And, you know, I, I can't really be super two-way guy. I can't, like, fly the flag because that would be a problem with my career. But um, also being somebody that's allowed a lot of people that – I'm not going to say anti-gunner. I'm just going to say non-gunner. And being really conscious of when you're having those discussions with the non-gunners, not getting too far into, like – you know, some of the rhetoric you hear from our side, off-putting to the other side and trying to really think about how, you know, you're, you're hearing out their point of view and then, you know, you're having a discussion and not a debate. And um, just being and like, kind of like what Ghost was saying is like, you know, when they hear from the media, whatever, and then you're saying, well, there's also this. And then you have a logical argument to say that, you know, that's not true, but you're not putting a lot of emotion into it. You're more in logic and reason. Um, I think that's kind of where I'm trying to always do that with the people that I know aren't anti-gunners, just the non-gunners, because like gunners, guns really aren't a part of their life, but they don't really care one way or the other. But, you know, they're also the people that are going to vote one way or the other. So 
trying to show them exactly what he said is that like, you know, our side has some really legitimate arguments and here they are without trying to be off putting as well. Yeah. When I, when, when people ask me why I choose to carry, cause I, you know, I carry pretty much, you know, 365, you know, 24, 365, unless I'm in a spot where I'm just not legally allowed to carry. Um, the, the first thing I tell them is, you know, the chances of me getting in a gunfight is less than the chance of me getting hit by lightning. So, so the first thing I do is I let them know that, that I'm not, you know, like radically afraid and I'm not paranoid and all that. But, but then I say, but you know, I have lightning rods on my house. And, and it, it's just kind of one of those... Yeah, I know it's a really low chance that I might ever get involved in a gunplay, but you know what? Eh, it doesn't it doesn't cost me anything to carry this thing around, and and I think that people really appreciate the fact that I understand that we're talking about a low probability event, and I'm just trying to be as cognizant of my own safety as I am my house's safety. And and I think that that brings it to a level they can they can get their their arms around and say, oh okay, well you're not a nut, you know you're you're just, you know you're just playing the odds basically, and and I think that helps a lot. Well, I think you hit on something really nice there, and I think that the misconception of a lot of people is that we are nuts, and then, like I said, if we can kind of prove that we're not nuts, we're just more people that have different passions than you do, but we're not nuts, you know? Most, most non-gunners think people that carry guns are paranoid. Exactly. And, and that is the truth of the matter. They think we're paranoid. And it's kind of one of those, hey, if you can, if you can admit to them and say, well, you know, I got to defend myself. I got to be ready to go at a moment's notice. No, that's paranoid. You say, hey, I know that this is a low probability event. I'm just hedging my bet. That's all. And, and I think that makes us seem a lot more normal and rational and reasonable. Anybody else want to throw anything in there? You know, the, the thing that hasn't been mentioned yet, and it's the thing we bring up all the time, and if I knew a better way to to go about this, I think we'd all be doing it. It's the normalization, right? So... If, if you're talking to somebody about a gun, then they're probably already open to the concept. They're probably already of a objective mind type of thing, even if they're a non-gunner. The problem we have is normalizing. How do you normalize something? How do you do something that puts it in front of people's faces and shows them that you're all going home safe, no one's going to be injured or have their rights violated today that is the ultimate question and has been the ultimate question every time this topic comes up i think we bring this we've talked about this so many times and it's it's real and you know as much as we've talked about like oh you know open carry isn't the best way to go about doing this open carry kind of is one of the best ways to go about doing this if you can do it in a way that doesn't make people freak out um, how you do that? I don't know. I don't know how you go about that. And, and we've talked about the grassroots efforts of, well, we just need to take more people to the range. And we've done that. My wife is standing right here. We've taken people to the range. Um, we've taken people to the range and, and we've, we've done safety things with people. We've done the whole nine yards. And until you can reach a larger audience and show people that guns are everywhere, and it's not just the police, because remember, they know the police have guns, but those people are trained. And so that's okay that they have guns, right? You got to break down all these arguments. You can just see the arguments already. You just start thinking about this and you start walking through the arguments. I don't know what to do. I really don't know what to do. I haven't known what to do for years in this case, other than just open carrying. And that brings on a whole nother 
realm of garbage that you have to wade through. Within our own community, you have to you wade through that garbage. It's it's a it's one of the the toughest things that that I think about often is how do you how do you reach the 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 non gun people but the non objectively paying attention the people who don't really think about guns until a tragedy comes up see that's the thing is we're constantly battling the media showing us when guns are used to create a tragedy that's a minority a super minority. So we have to show how guns are omnipresent wherever you go and and you go home safe most of the time. Like you mentioned, it's more likely that you're going to get struck by lightning. How do you do that? I don't know. Is it carry openly? I don't know. All right. Well, I think there's no wrong answers, of course, but... Um... You know, obviously, I'm just done with this gun rights policy conference. I've been watching it for eight years with scrutiny. I've been aware of it for longer than that, a lot longer than that. And I know we've had these issues and they've been more and less um, like pertinent or more and less ominous. And you know, we all know that we've got issues with, um, with um, what's the word when you don't give a shit? Um, apathy. Apathy. apathy, thank you. Uh, when we're not at risk. But um, I think that a couple of things um, can be worked on, uh, understanding where we come from so we're not repeating the same thing over and over, uh, learning what resources we have. Hey, there's Alice. I hope he's going to jump in and tell us how his interview went. If he's interested, he's got a link. He's one of the first people I sent a link to. So um, anyway, um, uh, I think that we do a lot of repetition. I think that a lot of us are doing the same things over and over and over. And tradition and routine doesn't mean efficiency or it's making any headway. I think it needs to be evaluated. So I'm going to be curious to, I'm going to be hope, hopeful that people will be interested in not just watching me try to struggle by myself, but interested in helping out. Uh, but I believe that we're wasting our time uh, having a bunch of people uh, effort in different directions. We all have strengths and weaknesses. We all have different perceptions of the different arguments. I think it can do us all some good to just start to catalog all the different arguments and all the different uh, efforts that have been uh, successful or failures over the years. Um, archiving uh, with a timeline and with, uh, you know, is efficiently as possible or in like is you know with infographics and so that it can the information doesn't need to be poured over like some kind of a quiz uh bringing us all up to a level where we can all speak more confidently and confidently with whoever it might be i think that by taking our our struggle and quant and, and dividing it into the actual tasks at hand just from your guys's explanations everyone's talking to a different so a different audience, right? Sometimes we're talking about anti-gun or sometimes we're talking about people in the middle. Um, what would happen if we had all of the gun owners on one side? So there's there's value in communicating with just existing gun owners and getting us all on track. Um, I think one of the things we can effort towards as a group would be to quantify all the different positions and angles and battles that we've got, take a look at all the resources we've got see where things are being covered and where there's gaps in our defense and in our offense and taking a look at some various strategies. We we know how to play defense. We do it by default all the time. Everything we do is to train to be defensive. We, we train to not be aggressive and to, to have lethal resistance at our disposal, but you know, very few people go out and train to actually be offensive. And in the political landscape, we're killing ourselves or we're dying by not being offensive. We need to start being offensive as well. So I'm throwing a bunch of stuff out there uh, just as a initial uh, effort. And, um, you know, with this show and with our projects, we're going to continue to uh, try to uh, help everyone know where we are so that we can start standing on each other's shoulders and the shoulders of those that came before us and not repeat effort and not uh, duplicate uh, things and instead, you know, move forward and hopefully with some in, some intent, uh, less less uh, frustration and more 
deliberate action. Once we see a goal and we see the steps required to get to that goal, and we start to see steps accomplished, and we know that by working together, we learn to collaborate and to, uh, you know, to, to learn to work better and better together, and we bring more people on board, uh, that could accomplish some of the things you guys had frustrations with, like how do we change you know, things? How do we do that? Well, one thing is by winning. And you, know, you start getting rid of 4473s, you start getting rid of uh, significant federal level stuff. Um, we disregard uh, wins, like having every single state have CCW. We overlook that and we just you know, act like that's no big deal. That was a tremendous effort and it took a long, long time. It took a long time for the people who are working against us to, to achieve no states having CCW. And uh, I'd like to put some of those kind of struggles in perspective so that you know, if we know something might be a 10 year battle, then why are we getting frustrated three years in? So that's a bunch of collab Great point. Great point. Um, Great point. Alex. Um, and hopefully people will stick with me on that. I really do. I am grat grateful for the people that are uh, supporting us on the Patreon for these efforts. And uh, although I don't put out videos, there's nothing really fancy to show you from Gun Rights Policy Conference. I absorbed a lot. I've got a big project that's allowing me to take this trip and I have to put effort into that. But every spare moment is working on how we can stop spinning our wheels and how we can get some traction. And uh, I know enough people that uh, I think we should be able to um, you know, work as a group to, to put connections together. And, and if there's a blogger who sucks at video and there's a video guy who doesn't write enough description, we all know those people. Let's get people together. Let's learn from each other's strengths and weaknesses and I'll become more proficient uh, without changing our, our stuff. But anyway, Ellis, how did it go? Do you want to talk about it? We all heard about your... Yeah, sure, man. I'm, I'll talk about it. Uh, I went in. Um, you know, waited around a few minutes, like always. And well, uh, let's talk to uh, just preface it with uh, so people that don't know what's going on. You got a, a, a job interview over at PSA, almost yeah. like State Army. Yes, yes. And uh, you were telling oh, the guys free guns for everybody. You were telling the guys about it on whose chat yesterday? Ah, uh, whose was it? I think it was uh, Knives, wasn't it? I don't know. I just heard about it. Uh, I didn't see uh, it. I think it was on Knives, Chip. Uh, I had mentioned it on, on uh, NEAs before his program. Then I talked about it a little bit on mine. And this morning I was talking about it with uh, uh, Potatoes and uh, Knives, Sean. So, yeah, that's that happened today. I uh, went in, you know... Um, very cordial, you know. I actually did something I never do and put on a suit to do this. This th that is something that just don't happen with me ever. Um, I felt like a fish out of water, but the interview went well. Um, he explained how they do things, how the uh, hiring process works there, and basically what it is is they do the interview. They send the information they get to their home office, wherever that may be. And, you know, they converse back and forth, make a final decision, and then they call you and let you know what's going on. Um, they offer benefits, uh, health, dental, uh, vision, and a 401k. So... It's a good job. If if I'm lucky enough to land it, I will be a, a very happy individual. Right on. How did it feel? What do you think? Uh, it felt great. It, I think it went well. But, you know, with those kind of deals, you never know. I mean, there was three guys that were interviewing after me. So. And this is for working in the factory or working in the stores? Yeah, it's a storefront. Right on. Well, I wish you all the best, dude. That's cool. Cool that you got a chance to do that. How far away is it if you get it? Uh, 20 minutes. Oh, that's awesome. I thought it was, I, got, I guess I had the impression it was like a two hour drive or something. No, no, no. I mean, there's, that's there's several, better. yeah, there's several stores that they have throughout the state. So, very cool. Well, thanks for jumping in. Hey, thanks for having me.
Um, we were talking about staging guns. We are talking about how often you practice. I don't know if you want to throw anything in on that. Uh, I practice as much as I possibly can, which here lately has not been a whole lot. But, you know, I do a lot of dry firing. I do a lot of, you know, practicing the draw, stuff like that. Um, just things that, you know, keep myself, you know, up to standard. Right on. Well, guys, I keep yawning here, and I am not going to have much life left in me. So I appreciate everybody uh, being patient with us starting a little bit early. And thanks to uh, Woods for jumping in right at the beginning there. Everybody else for joining. Um, you know, it's all about keeping the lines of communication open. We know we're just one motherfucker away from having to deal with a, a, a defense again certainly hope that we can motivate enough people to work on offense before that so that we have a little uh, different paradigm next time around. we got the midterm elections coming up and I'm on the gun show loophole tour. So we're going to be watching uh, or paying, uh, visiting more and more gun shops here as time goes and uh, eventually round and going west uh, and then down south again. So uh, some more museums in the near future. Um, anybody want to plug anything before we head out? Got cycle, got any videos coming? No, nothing new. I, I actually, I got to call my guy from Czechoslovakia because he was supposed to make me a, a, a stock for one of my Carcanos and I haven't heard anything from him. So it's mm -hmm. time for me to give him another call. Now, when you were on your vacation traveling around, any opportunity to check out gun shops or anything like that? Uh, not gun shops per se, but I did go to a military museum in Norway that was uh, fairly interesting. But what I what I discovered was Norway doesn't make anything for themselves. Everything they got, they they got from the Americans, the English, or you know other guys like that. Uh, so I I did have I did go to one. Uh, military installation where they had a museum that had a lot of really interesting stuff. Uh, like I'd never actually seen a mine, you know, a water mine before, you know, like cut open so you could see how it actually worked. That was pretty cool. Pictures? That's, that's some pretty stuff. Yeah, yeah, lots of pictures. All right, well, hopefully do a video on what you know, to remember what all happened over there. Yeah. I don't know. Fun stuff. Uh, Ghost, what's your next show? Just guesting. Um, okay. What's up? You're guesting until Tuesday? Yeah, until Tuesday. I have, I'll have Tactical Tuesday, and then I've got the podcast that I'm working on. So uh, the cool thing with the podcast is it's a lot easier to get guests to come on that because it can be whenever they have time instead of a specific day and time. So I'm, I'm kind of working on the podcast right now, and you know, work's going to start slowing down, so I'll start be pumping out some videos here pretty frequently. What else? Another thing, I'm going to give you a free tip here. You might want to talk to somebody who has a blog. If they mention you on your blog, you're going to get more hits. Yeah, apparently I might get like, you know, two comments or something. Let's not get exaggerated. Let's not put the cart through the comments. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, anytime... I don't wait for me to call you. If you got some time, call me because I'm working yeah, on sure. a project right now. I'm mostly setting and only driving a little bit, trying to get this project done. So I'm always looking okay. for Frank to not do that. So yeah, sounds okay. good. We'll definitely do that. Bosch got the ham radio crash course. Friday. Ham radio crash course. Yeah, Friday, seven p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I did a video a while back on little um, SDR dongles. These are receivers, software-defined radio dongles that you just plug into your computer. Well, I got the granddaddy here, the, the big boy SDR, which is an SDR play. Um, this will go all the way from like five kilohertz to three gigahertz. I think is the uh, is the specs on it. I haven't written all the specs down, but this little box will let you receive just about anything you can do all the ha uh, amateur radio bands you can do air traffic you can do vhf uhf you name it you can do it and then you can get the sot because it all runs on your computer you can get the software to download uh, to decode p25 for police uh, bands pretty much you name it you can do it with this so we'll cover that this friday so 
couple of things that plugs in so your interface is software. Mm -hmm. The hardware, is it upgradable? It looks like a solid box. Solid box. Uh, they make a couple different versions of this, uh, but even the base model is really, really comparable. They make an upgraded one that has two antenna inputs, which the two antenna inputs is nice. So if you're really big into listening to air traffic control, which I know a lot of people are, you plug one in and you listen to the pilots as they're overhead, and you plug the other one into the actual air traffic data line, and you can actually decode the data line, and you can watch the planes flying overhead via software and listen to the air traffic controller um, at the same time. And then second question, you know, you're talking the whole spectrum, being able to receive the whole spectrum, then you get into like a billion different kind of antennas to be, you know, good for each of those different radio waves sections. So how does one antenna deal with all that? Yeah, so you generally, you generally can't, um, that is a good point. Um, you will have difficulties receiving some frequencies depending on where you're at um, on the bandwidth. Also, uh, you're generally slicing the bandwidth up in chunks and you can move around, but the chunks are really big. Right. The cool thing with SW, uh, SDRs is that you can download the whole bandwidth and technically replay it and hop around and re-listen to parts you never listened to. So you could you could download, copy, save, record um, a large chunk of the AM band, for example, and then go back later and, and listen to different shows or different parts in radio at the same at, at different times. And then just plug different antennas in if you're listening to different angles on the bandwidth? Or yeah, but I mean, generally, generally the, the people that sell these advocate just a wire antenna and a wire antenna will get you a lot of, um, a lot of things. The okay. problem that you run into with different antennas is on the transmit side. This is just a receiver. It's just for receiving data. So um, really, that's that's all you need to get started is a receiver type device like this. Right on. And then what's the interface? Is it confusing or pretty easy? Uh, it, some of the software packages can be confusing. And, and it's generally the software because you're using your computer. So it's going to be a, a an application. Some of those applications can be a little little um, hard to maneuver, but once you figure out what you're doing, that you're just playing around with the radio waves, it's it's pretty simple at that point. Very interesting. So that's what it's all about with amateur. Uh, what does that even stand for? Well, ham doesn't have stand for anything. It's amateur radio, and they just sort of call it amateur, I guess. But, yeah, uh, it, it just means a, a access to different uh, bandwidths if, or bands of operation. If well, you but ham doesn't mean anything, I guess. It doesn't stand for anything. But, there's um, there's lots of different ideas of what people think it stands for, but it's all contention and contention. Yes, yeah, it comes from the word amateur. But um, whatever it is, it's the uh, the curiosity and uh, basically the ability to go out there and and do different things and seek out new stuff. But then, of course, the engineer side of it, uh, people are creating new things. So I would imagine that's something I would have maybe thought of as science fiction 10 years ago. So it's kind of cool to see that things are evolving and it's not just, you know, new versions of tube radios or whatever. We keep going into new stuff. And yeah. eventually what that means, well, the reason I think it's neat, I'm not really that much of a electronics nerd or anything like that. What I look at that as is less and less uh, necessity for Al Gore's old fashioned tubes. And, you know, eventually that stuff will uh, come up and, well, potentially, at least not say eventually, but at least potentially uh, replace a lot of this Al Gore's uh, old fashioned tube internet with internets that can't be controlled or can't be shut down instead or true grass loops, um, whatever that's called. Anyway, yeah, like private stuff. internet. Yeah, it's it's well, possible now. Yeah, well, that's certainly what saying. happens during emergencies. Yeah, and exactly. That's but that's the thing. You know, when, when the main infrastructure is down, ham radio is what pulls your nuts out of the fire. Yeah. Right. But right now it only happens with few and when, you know, it's needed. So eventually that'll become more often and eventually replace the crap that requires fiber optics and everything else. Anyway, it's just neat. And I'm glad you're doing that. And thanks for doing it on gun channels because, you know, it's all about um, lots of stuff over on gun channels and 
radios incorporate all kinds of preparedness and awareness and First Amendment stuff. So thanks for continuing to do that. Absolutely. Be prepared, man. Whatever that means, whether it means be armed or be prepared for information gathering and transference. Seriously, being in a in a situation where you don't know what's going on because uh, because all the established stuff is turned off and we already know. I mean, I've driven through towns where they've done drills and they just turn off everything. Your phone is useless. Uh, it's nice to be able to have a device that costs you thirty dollars and a little bit of foresight uh, to be able to turn on. And I don't know what the news is telling us, but I hear the police officers talking to each other. Or I hear the fire department talking to each other, and I got a you know much better idea of what's going on and you know knowing that don't need to panic or whatever um so yeah yeah thanks for doing all that woods anything coming up not just uh keeping america's youth thinking for themselves and teaching them how to read and math and writing and all that stuff how dare you all right um outlaw good luck on the uh results there everybody's rooting for you so you've got a bunch of people on your side uh, hopefully uh, that'll help and if not learn and apply again but i'm guessing you'll probably get it they had to figure out you were digging that and those other people were probably like yeah it's just a job whatever well um i appreciate that gene lives uh I, i'm excited you know I was, I was nervous going into this thing this morning uh i don't know why i've been to 100 interviews in my life but for some reason, this one got me. Um, well, I tell you what, as a person who's hired before, um, you can you can teach anything. What you can't teach is interest and passion, and I'm sure that came through. Well, I, I would hope so. Um, I mean, we I even plugged gun channels while I was there, by the way. So doing my part, doing my part. Well, that's awesome um i guess that's it thanks to the people that watched that took the time and the effort to watch it on gun channels gun channels ain't perfect but it's ours <laughs>